Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and a huge, huge welcome to Produce, Mix, Fix and Conquer. So it's been a few weeks, we've been away, and however, we've got a fantastic guest coming up for you next, Mr. Justin Perkins. So Justin is an absolute, absolutely phenomenal mastering engineer out of the USA at Mystery Mastering Room. Justin has worked with some incredible bands like The Replacements and Anne Boleyn. He's also been a musician himself as well. Now, Justin, you'll probably recognize from WaveLab, and he is a massive advocate for WaveLab, and you'll recognize him on the Steinberg website as well. His room is absolutely incredible. He's got so many amazing mastering toys in his room, ready to share with us all as well, uh, as well as very kindly offering to show us today some of his uh, screen flows as well. So what will be great and really interesting is to suss out how he works and how he does his craft. And also we'll be chatting to him about some of the background as well. So do feel free to send your questions through because I'm sure you can have many, many questions for Justin um, as we go through today. So without further ado, Justin Perkins. Hey there, man. Doing well. Thanks for having me. How are you? Yeah, really, really good. Just glad to be back. And uh, yeah, great to have you on today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Awesome, man. So yeah, so like we said, so today uh, we'll start off like with what we've done with our previous guests and really have a chat about your your background and how you started off initially uh, in the music world as well. And also have a chat as well about your amazing studio and your workflow and uh, what you do at your studio, if that's cool with you. Yeah, that sounds great. Brilliant. Yeah, so let's start at the very beginning then, Justin. So uh with music when you were a kid growing up i understand that you were a massive beatles fan was it your parents that got you into them yeah initially i mean i think the the beatles finally came to cd in like 1987 i think was when the first generation of cds came out and i'm pretty sure they got me a you know a few of their at least a few of their cds when cds you know so late 80s maybe 1990 and then Coincidentally, my fifth grade teacher was a huge Beatles fan, and every Friday he would bring his guitar to school, and we would end the week. Well, we already got out early on Friday, so that was already a bonus. And then we would end the day, um, you know, after lunch, we, he would bring his guitar out and he would sing, play, and sing Beatles songs, and the class would sing along, and yeah. he would put the lyrics up on the projector, and it was just a really fun way to end the week, and it really got me into the Beatles, and. I had a little cheap guitar, but it kind of got me interested in playing it and learning chords and things like that. So a combination of parents and then my teacher and, you know, and they're a great band. And I got to see Paul McCartney, must have been 89 or not. It was my last day of sixth grade. So about a year wow. later, I got to go see Paul McCartney and skip the last day of school. And um, that was pretty cool, too. So, yeah, just got into it kind of early on when I was pretty young. Amazing, man. So cool. So I understand as well that you were a Nirvana fan as well. So you listened to like Nevermind like the rest of us did in the early 90s. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, also in f fifth grade, it was a big year for me, I guess. I think I was in fifth grade when Nevermind came out. So I don't know how old I would have been, but maybe uh, I can't even do the math right now. I don't do yeah. math. I don't do math anymore. But um, yeah, fifth grade, Nevermind came out and it was pretty amazing just to see and hear it because you know, I grew up kind of in a small town, not real, it was connected to a lot of towns, it wasn't remote yeah. by any means, but no internet back then, um, no brothers or sisters to show me the cool stuff. So, I mean, or I should say older brothers or sisters to introduce me to cool stuff. So, I mean, I, I had mm -hmm. like top 40 radio and oldies radio, um, and that was about it. And then when Nirvana came around, it was like, wow, this actually sounds like something I can identify. It's not like Milli Vanilli and right said fred and yeah. vanilla ice and mc hammer nothing against any of those but it was so oh. s synthesized that like i never even thought it never even crossed my mind to try to make something like that it's like where do yeah. you even start but when i heard nirvana i was like oh that's drums and guitars and bass and a guy singing and screaming and maybe we could do that with friends so that was a pretty pivotal album to come out right at that time too absolutely same for me as well man it's like i literally i actually heard Nirvana smells like teen spirit before I actually heard it on the radio. It was actually um, a kid was playing it at school in a band and I just heard that intro riff and it's just, it's life changing for a lot of kids, I suppose, at that moment in time, though, wasn't it? Because you didn't have all the streaming services like what we've got now. And, you know, you just, that was just the way to find music, wasn't it, to be fair? And like kind of people 
played it on the radio or they just gave you a CD and you copied the CD and that was it. You know, it's, I'm guessing that's how you found a lot of music as well. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was MTV. Um, and then at one, uh, my, I had a, so my across the street neighbor was a little older than me and then he had an older brother. So they were into a little bit more punk rock stuff and a little more yeah. underground and that, that opened a whole um, avenue of other artists. And we just had a really, we had a really great independent record store chain in our area that you would kind of hear about these bands and you would go there and they would, by some miracle, they would usually have it and you could buy it and it was pretty great. So, you know, again, this is a little bit before inter- ordering on the internet and stuff like that. Um, so it was just a bunch of little things that led to getting into music and particularly independent and underground music and, yeah. and, and finding a way to then start a career in music which i didn't know i was doing at the time but you know recording bands in my dad's basement and their practice space you know just for fun just because there's nothing else to do sort of turned into a career without i never thought of it as as a career it never seemed like it was possible in high school Um, but yeah it kind of happened that way man tell us what what was your rig like back then so what rig were you using when you're recording those bands as a kid uh a, a cassette which I guess they're cool again now, but it was a cassette eight track task cam. Yeah. And the eighth track didn't always work. You had to press it down on a certain spot. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. it wouldn't play back. So you'd have to like press down on it to get it to make sure it would play back when you were doing your mix down. So it was kind of a seven and a half track really. Um, and then I was renting it from a guy, you know, he put up an ad at the music store and said, Hey, I have this, I think he was just too busy with his painting business and said, Hey, I got this, recording gear and I'll rent it out. And I just kept renting it so much. I think I eventually rented to own it. And then he eventually, I think before I owned it, he switched over to a digital eight track. So it was like a digital, basically the same thing. But the cool thing was there was like a very primitive version of playlists, you know, so you could like yeah. maybe try a new vocal take without erasing the old one. I mean, it was super primitive. Yeah. Um, and then I graduated to a half inch 16 track. Um, I went to the recording workshop in Ohio for about a half a year, which is as long as the program was. It was, I didn't go to college. I went to a little recording workshop. And when I got home from that, I, I decided it was time to upgrade to something better, but I was kind of not really into computers at that time. This was the year 2000. Yeah. And, you know, I was aware of computers, but I didn't really want to own one. Um, so I just got a, I, I, I found one that, um, had never been open. It was the guy bought it in 1989. I bought it in 2000. He had never opened it. So it was a mint condition Tascam half inch 16 track, which then meant I also had to get a mixing board because up until then the mixing board was built right into the thing, whether it was. Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah, very primitive stuff and it kind of grew from there, but you know, it was fun to learn on analog. Um, I'm not a tech person. I don't know how to fix stuff. So to me, it was important that it was brand new You know, it was in perfect condition never had a problem with it yeah probably could have been calibrated better but i didn't know any better at the time but you know it worked and then eventually moved over to a daw when i started working at a actual studio that wasn't in my dad's basement because he had a he had just moved to a computer system and slowly got into computers that way absolutely amazing so cool what what style of music was it back then was it mainly like punk bands was it and kind of garage bands and that sort of stuff Oh yeah, I mean after Nirvana, then Green Day was huge, so it was a lot of punk bands. Yeah, it was a mixture of grunge and punk bands, from what I remember. Yeah. I didn't really do any of the new metal stuff because I feel like that stuff had to be very well produced. I mean, it was the early days of drum samples, yeah, pro, pro tooling. You know, by the late '90s, people were kind of starting to tune th- You know, really, which I ended up getting really into in the 2000s for a lot of the stuff I did. But back then. If it, like a new metal, if a, a band that sounded like Limp Biscuit came and recorded with me, it would have just sounded totally terrible because of the my skill set and the tools, you know. But yeah, you know, I could yeah, do a punk. Sense. I could do a punk band and it would sound like them, and it was fine. It didn't need a yeah. lot of it didn't need a lot of sprucing up. But I didn't do a lot of the more involved productions just because I didn't know how and nobody asked me. No, it makes sense, man. Absolutely. As well, I was a skate punker as well, like in the late nineties as well. So I was completely into like similar sort of genre, like Green Day, MXPX, and all those bands as well. So, uh, part of the your next part of the journey, there, man. So, tell us what was the next stage for you then? So, when you thought, right, I'm going to take this thing serious. Um, I mean, I understand that you were in bands. So, were you in the bands 
first or were you actually you know taking recording and mixing and mastering more seriously first which, which how did it what was the timeline how did it all come about for you it was both and then it flip flop it was bands first just because that's what people in high school do that are in my position you know i just we had friends that could play music we we're in bands yeah started out recording our own band just out of necessity and then it kind of then it was kind of even like i'm recording a lot of bands but playing in bands and then it just kind of flipped the other way where the recording took over so much of my time and actually presented a way to make a living that I had to stop doing the bands playing in bands as much because just the lack of time and, you know, being, being realistic about what I do with my time, you know, like, you know, I could go on a two week tour and come home with a few hundred bucks if I'm lucky, or I could stay home and record a bunch of bands and not have to worry about it and sleep in my own bed. So um, it wasn't really a tough decision and it wasn't something I really, even tried to do it just was very organic like hey all these bands are calling me um i ended up um the band i was in we knew better than i knew better than to record us yeah um, you know we got a little deal with lookout records which is where green day started oh nice uh, before they got huge their first two yeah. records were on lookout and i was smart enough to know that like i shouldn't record this because at the time i didn't i could do demos and local stuff but this was like at the time felt like a big deal so we went to the best studio in the area and I got to know the owner pretty well and he invited me to bring my recording equipment to his studio and, and work out of there because he had a weird mill job with crazy hours where it's like he'd do like 12 or 16 hour days and then he would like have four days it was very bizarre so he had a lot of his studio sat empty a lot is what I'm trying to say yeah so he's like hey if my studio is empty so much when I'm working my he never quit his you know mill job or whatever so even yeah. though he was very good at recording. Um, but long story short, you know, I started recording bands out of there, whether it was my own clients or um, bands that called or bands that had called him and yeah. didn't really care who they worked with. They just had to record something. You know, I did a lot of polka albums. I don't know if you know polka. Yeah, you know, polka is cool. Yeah, polka is yeah. huge in Wisconsin. And then yeah. upper Wisconsin, it's still, I mean, they still have polka festivals up there. Yeah. And and I did a lot of polka albums, which was actually a lot of fun because there's no overdubs. They just play it. Really? And then they might play it one more time. Yeah. And like the tuba player might have hit a wrong note, so you, you could just slide it around. This is I was using digital. I mean, it was so much fun to record polka bands because mm. it was just a bunch of funny old guys and really low stress, you know, basically live recording. You know, they didn't there was no uh doubling of vocals and tuning. It was just a kind of that's a good kind of workout, just learning how to capture things live and get it right yeah. on the first. But it wasn't all polka bands. But my point was, it was anything and everything. Whoever called and wanted to record, that's who we recorded. So it was a good workout. So yeah, at some point, playing in bands died off. But then I kept getting offers that I didn't want to say no to. Um, there's a band called Screeching Weasel that I listened to a lot in, when I was mm. younger. And at some point, he needed a, a bass player. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. And then um you know then i thought i was done playing live you know i got good earplugs because i'm like i gotta preserve my ears so i got the good yeah. earpl i got the good earplugs that sound good and are molded uh and then tommy stinson from the replacements is like I was, I was doing some studio stuff for him and then he's um needed a bass player for some stuff and next thing you know i'm in an actual band um going it started as like random long weekends to like now we're doing two and three week tours and st stuff like that and i just couldn't keep up with the touring and this is not yeah. even that long the thing with tommy stinson was not that long ago um, yeah but i just said you know I, I can't be gone for two and three weeks back uh, back to back you know my studio will die if i do that um, yeah so i had to stop doing that but yeah so a lot that's a long way of saying you know basically studio work whether it was recording and mixing back in the day or mastering for the last 10 years um it just kind of became my preference but that's awesome man thanks for that and it's really interesting as well like at this um part of your journey as well so i understand that you went to various studios is that right so but tell us about some of the studios that you've worked at over over yeah. the years well after my dad's basement it was called i moved to a place in green bay wisconsin called uh simple studios yeah and again that was where all the i always say this in interviews but 
if you bought like a local band CD, you could tell within the first four seconds if they did it at Simple Studios because it just sounded great. We're like, damn, how did they get it to sound this good? And you look in yeah. the booklet. Oh, yeah, Simple Studio. I mean, you didn't yeah. have to look in the booklet. You just knew it was a great rock and punk studio. So it was mm. actually pretty cool for me to be able to work there. It was at that point, like I didn't have any bigger ambitions. It's just like, yeah, this is the place. Uh, it was fun. But and then I got an offer to move to Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin, which is um, Butch Vig from the band Garbage. And he, of course, produced Nevermind by Nirvana. Awesome. It, it wasn't recorded at Smart, although a lot of people think it was. Yeah. Um, the song Polly, the acoustic one, was done at Smart, but the rest of it yeah. was done in L.A. But anyways, I spent some time at Smart Studios. Similar situation where I was on staff, but it wasn't like a 40-hour-a-week thing. It was... I was on staff when bands would call and didn't have an engineer preference. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I would get certain gigs, but then I was also doing my own projects there, you know, um, bands that still wanted to work with me and things like that. So smart studios, but I could kind of tell that it wasn't going to be around forever because, and as you know, the, I was ended up being correct, but you know, this is 2006, I want to say five, 2005 or six when I started there and that was kind of the tail end of bands having bigger budgets. Um, they did a lot of big records at Smart, but then by the time I was really there for a while, it was like maybe one or two big records were done there. Yeah. Like I think Death Cab for Cutie mixed plans there. Um, but that was like few and far between. It was a lot of more local stuff. It was people coming in to do drums and then taking it home to finish and then maybe coming back to mix if they had a yeah. budget. So. I saw the writing on the wall there because that place had somewhat of an overhead. You know, it was, a, it was on a busy street in the most expensive city in Wisconsin. Um, they had a, a little bit of a staff and a studio manager, a part-time technician, just a lot of overhead. I'm like, this is not going to last. You know, there's just no way. So I ended up moving to Milwaukee, Wisconsin with no real plan other than hitting up a bunch of studios to just work freelance, you know, say, hey, can I rent out your studio? to record this band and I found a few that and that worked for a couple of years but I ended up renting a uh, a former mastering studio so that's how I transitioned into mastering officially wow you know I had been doing full mastering on low budget projects for a long time and people started asking me to do mastering specifically and I had to be like you know I'm not really a mastering engineer I just did it because no one else was going to do it yeah. and the band didn't have any money but there was um, whenever we could, we would send it to this mastering studio in Milwaukee called Mastermind, and he was the mastering person. You know, he had the whole the whole deal. It looked like a legit mastering studio. It was a legit mastering studio, and at some point, he decided to move um, out to the East Coast, so uh, way far away from there, but he said, hey, do you want to rent my room? Of course, it didn't have any gear, but it was already built out pretty nicely. Yeah. So that was a no-brainer, and then I'm like, okay, now I'm going to take mastering seriously because... People have been asking me to do it. I want to do it. I had this room that I fell into. And I I did still do a little mixing and recording there. There was a little front room that we turned into an overdub booth. Um, oh, cool. So it, it was kind of, yeah, it was cool because I could still take on some more, you know, I could take on the mixing and recording projects I wanted to, like that yeah. I was really into while I was trying to figure out mastering, um, kind of about, and I couldn't do drums there, but I could uh, do everything but drums, basically. And then yeah. I could also rent it out. I had an assistant, a friend slash assistant, that rented it out sometimes, too. Um, you know, they did a, a pretty big soundtrack for a movie there um, and just random stuff. So I, then it was cool because then I didn't have to be there every day. I was like, okay, I can take a day away from the studio and there's still some income coming yeah. in. So that was kind of nice for a while. But then when I switched to mastering 100%, you know, then now it's, if I'm not here doing it, nothing's getting done kind of thing. But so that's a long way of saying, you know, went from Green Bay to Madison to Milwaukee. And now I'm technically back in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, this is a newer room for me, but it's actually, I've actually, um, in the last few months, I'm getting even more version one approvals than ever. I mean, it was already fairly high, which is a pr nice, but I mean. Awesome. It's, always, it's always scary to change rooms, but I mean, yeah. if anything, it's like everything's sounding and working better. Every, version one is usually the winner. It's great. So um, hopefully I'll be here for a while now. 
Oh man, that's so cool. Did you miss um, mixing as well? Are you quite happy fully now in the mastering realm? I I don't miss mixing because I got too a little too OCD and obsessive about it. Yeah. Not like it has to be my way or the highway, but I I started I was putting in way too much bonus time outside of what the budget allowed. Yeah. Um, and I was starting to get some higher profile. Band, you know, I, one of the last records I did was for Sub Pop Records, um, which is um, in Seattle. So yeah. I was starting to get some bigger budget projects, you know, the, and if I would have stuck with that, maybe it would have grown from there. But I felt like at the time I was putting in way more time than the budgets allowed for mixing. And that's just not sustainable, you know. Um, but yeah. I couldn't I couldn't just stop at eight o'clock and say, time's up. This is the mix. Yeah, um, we're putting it out now. I, I'd be like, no, my name's going to be on it. I want it to be good, and um, I'm going to go longer. So I don't miss mixing because of the way budgets have shrunk, and I know people are still mixing and figuring out a way to make it work. But for me, the balance was off, and I just was really attracted to the pace of mastering, yeah, the, uh, the art and practice of mastering, and it was kind of great for me to f- leave mixing behind because then I learned a whole bunch of other things that I didn't even know existed about mastering. It's kind of like you don't know what you don't know until you really get into the weeds of it. So um, awesome. leaving mixing behind allowed me to just get that much better at mastering. So I don't miss it yeah. whatsoever. Um, I even get overwhelmed when people want to send me stems to master. I usually <laughs> say, no, you know, find a mix yeah. engineer. I usually say you're better off finding a mix engineer, even if it's an hour or two of their time, hire them to blend your stems a little better and then I'll yeah. master it. Cause I could go down a long tangent with stems, but if you master, I think if you master from stems, then you lose that perspective of having that, f- that first listen of it. Cause now you're mixing it too. And I, I just really don't care for stems. So definitely don't care for recording. And, you know, I just, um, I think being as my business grew, it got harder to be stuck in a room with a band for 12, 14 hours a day and not yeah. being able to keep up with, emails and other business things that you need to keep up with um i could do it when i was younger and it was fun i don't re i don't regret any of that time but i I got to a point in my life where i just couldn't do that anymore and so for a number of reasons mastering just got really attractive to me it's like because i could kind of pick my own schedule oh yeah and what i was going to say too is you know if if something comes in and the guitar is a little out of tune or some the drums are a little off time I can't do anything about that mastering. So I don't even go down that rabbit hole of wanting to fix it, you know, yeah. in, in mixing, I just got a little too perfectionist about it. Makes sense. Yeah, completely. I mean, what is, but so, but before, um, I know you very kindly said today, just since we're going to have a look around your room, we're going to have a look at your workflow in a few minutes as well. But what does an average day look like for you then as a mastering engineer, what does it look like for you now? How does it work and on your, on, on a Monday, for example? Uh, Monday, I mean, I have a, I moved to kind of a first come first serve project list. I have a project management app yeah. where I can put the projects in order of when they came in versus how urgent they are. What's their deadline? Um, you know, before I got real busy, I would try to manage it with like iCalendar, you know, Apple calendar and Gmail. And I was like, that just got to be too much. Cause you know, I, I can do a, I can master a single song in maybe an hour or so. So what's, yeah. My count. If I put it all on Google Calendar, it would just be a huge mess, and it would it wouldn't even follow a course because then yeah. this one needs a revision. So, I mean, I, I usually every day is a little bit different, which may seem strange, but you know I can master an album comfortably in a day. Um, there's some days where I literally do all singles. You know, there's times where it builds up where ten singles have come in, and and like a lot of miles are just not even plan on doing an album today i'll just do all these singles yeah or sometimes it's two or three eps in a day or sometimes it's an album and a few singles and then a revision you know some whether it's a revision to what i did if it's opening it up and it's a 10 minute tweak or it's they had to send me three new mix files of this album and that's going to take me a little longer to reprocess those so you know it's not like a like working at a bank where it's like I take my lunch break at eleven fifteen and no. get coffee at two. It's it's it depends on the flow if it's an e- album or EP or singles day. But um, I get going pretty early, which is nice. And 
I try not to work late anymore at weekends, but it still happens. I've been pretty busy this year, busier than ever. So um, it's just a matter of fitting it all in. But um, but I take a lot of ear breaks. You know, I like as I'll kind of show you later in this in this uh, interview. Yeah. You know, I dial everything in, and then if it's a forty minute record, it's going to take me forty minutes to run it through the analog chain, and I can give my ears a break and get move around and go do some things and then come back and finish it up you know i don't work um i'll, I'll talk more about that later but you know it's sure. it's uh i'm not sitting here for eight hours straight or 10 hours straight a day it's a lot of i have such a streamlined workflow that it's it allows me to to not have to sit here like that and it allows me to spend more time like focusing on the music and not on the details and um things that are not musical so awesome, i don't know man. if i really answered your question but it's it did. yeah that's yeah, great but it's pretty much you know i guess i shouldn't say i don't work I, I do work it's pretty rare when i don't work at least one day of the weekend sometimes too but maybe it's only for a few hours on a saturday and yeah it really just depends you know what what needs to happen um Absolutely. So I think as well for like kind of people just starting out um, in the mastering game as well or mixing, you know, they they always, you know, kind of they jump in themselves and especially like those that are self-employed and starting from scratch going, OK, well, what does a day look like and how do I get organized and how do I serve my clients in the best way as well? And it can be super tricky. Um, but yeah, that, that all aside, though, um, you know, a couple of uh, fun questions for you before we look at the maybe the technical stuff. What have been a couple of your favorite bands so far that you've, that you've worked on? I mean, I know that you've worked with The Replacements and Anne Boleyn. So what, what bands have you loved working on, you know, in the past few years recently? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, The Replacements, I'm a big fan of or was a big fan before I started working with them. So that's been nice. Those projects are honestly a little tedious because, I mean, the one that just came out is a 100-song box set. Um, wow. <laughs> the bonus Amazing. tracks were all over the place in terms of fidelity and what needed to happen and what was possible. Yeah. So those are, I mean, those are a little more exhausting to those big box sets. And it'll probably honestly be a little, probably a couple of years before I'm able to like, just listen to them for fun. You know, I'm kind of like need to take a break from that. Um, you know, honestly, it's with mastering, it's weird. And this, I, I want to jump back to your last question. Um, sure. Part of why I had to move to just mastering is that balance we talked about. If I was going to be working with a band in the studio, whether it's mixing or recording, I found it hard. I found it hard to balance mixing and mastering because, you know, you can spend all day mixing one song, and if you're tied up with an actual client in the room, this is before COVID, of course. Yeah. Um, and someone needs a quick mastering tweak, like, hey, we love the master, but we got to change the song order, or can you turn it up? At, little bit or something you know I, I found myself in situations where i'm like oh man I, I got this band in here for three days like when am i going to fit in this little tweak that should really only take 10 minutes and shouldn't I, my client shouldn't have to wait three days for this little adjustment um so that's yeah. when i just finally had to stop mixing like mixing was getting in my way of mastering so i found it hard to balance the two and that's another reason why i just quit mixing altogether is just the difference in time to complete a record was so different. I just couldn't do both. It was driving me crazy. But that ties into my answer is that when I'm mastering, I'm listening with such a, like a technical mindset that I'm not like sitting here enjoying the song as a person usually. And that doesn't mean I don't like it. It just means that I'm not even listening to the lyrics usually. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a different language for all I know at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's usually not until something comes out and I think to, to put it on, um, if I'm, you know, mowing the lawn or doing laundry or something around the house that I'll listen to it. And then sometimes that's when I realize just how great it is. And it always yeah. feels weird to talk about great records because, but I feel like with mastering, I had nothing to do with the greatness. You know, I didn't write the songs. I didn't produce them. I'm just, I don't feel like I, you know, made it great. I just made it presentable and, um, you know, be able to listen to it in any context, but I didn't make a mediocre song great. So I feel like I can talk about great records that worked out without being kind of uh, whatever that word is for that. But yeah. um, I don't even know. I mean, there's so many bands. I mean, I'd have to go to my website, honestly, and look at them all. Cause the other thing with mastering too, is, you know, if you're doing an album a day and, and in some singles, the amount of projects you do is just so massive compared to mixing. And yeah. 
when people ask me what I've worked on, I often have to open up my project list and see what's going yeah. on. It's like, oh yeah, I did do that. Um, yeah. You know, I just did a thing for this band called North Mississippi All Stars, who are I wouldn't call them an old band, but they're not young. Um, but a really great band. Um, yesterday, this band Beach Bunny put out a new single, and that's part of an exciting project that's uh, going to be rolling out. But um, awesome. they're, they're a good kind of power pop punk band from Chicago. Um, I don't know, man. Like, there's just so much stuff. There's just so much music, and it's the music world is just so saturated right now for better or worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's good for people like me because I'm very busy mastering, but yeah. Um, I mean, I just, I just don't even know how to answer that. It's just because projects are so quick, you know, like even yeah. if it's the best record of all time, I worked on it for one day and then if I get time to listen to it, then I'll listen to it. But I mean, the, I guess the projects are pretty, you know, uneventful. Usually it's like, Recording yeah. and mixing, you you might have had a great time in the studio working late and had fun, and then you had, took a dinner break and it was fun, and you you know went yeah. out for went out for beers afterwards and it was fun. Mastering is kind of boring in that regard. It's like they uploaded the files to me and then I listened to them and then I made them sound better and did yeah. all the did all the things and I sent it to them and then I didn't hear from them again till the next time they had me do that. It's just. You know, I don't want to make it sound like it's not fun, but it is fun for me. But yeah, I don't yeah. have a good no, I answer. It. I don't have a good answer for you that. I mean, I'd have to yeah. go to the website and run it down. I do like reissues of, and I, I don't just work with the replacements reissues. I've done a lot of reissues. Um, it's fun to, you know, try to make the album sound better, but not too different. You know, remastering is kind of controversial. There's been a lot of remasters that are just insanely loud. Yeah, I try to master them period correctly, like. I've been doing a lot of um, early 90s and late 80s hip hop reissues for a label. And, nice. um, you know, when that stuff came out, there was no digital limiting. So to yeah. master it, and I'm not, this is an anti loudness thing, but it's just an anti, or not even anti. It's like when this stuff came out, there was no digital limiting. It, so to master it insanely loud, it's going to sound wrong. And in fact, the guy just sent me a project because he's like, I had someone else master this and the the band isn't digging it and it's a reissue from something from the early nineties. And I put on, I put on the master and I'm like, Oh yeah, well they mastered it. Like it's Kanye's new album. It's like insanely loud, so much low end. I'm like, this is, sounds nothing like it would have sounded when it came out. I mean, there's room for, uh, you know, adapting to the times and things like that. But I mean, it was just so ridiculously wrong sounding for the yeah. period, you know, so I, I like reissue projects because you got to like find that balance of we need to respect the era that it came from, but we also need it to sound decent next to the new Kanye album and stuff like that. So, yeah, those are kind of fun. And then it's a lot of um, sometimes it's a lot of like RX restoration work, like getting rid of noise and clicks and pops and things like that. So, yeah, reissue projects are fun, but they're a little more time intensive than, you know, a record that's nicely mixed and everything's kind of already in place so i don't know awesome are you a big rx fan then i'm guessing so you do you use rx for a lot of your oh, work yeah. for the restoration stuff yeah rx is used on every project to some even a new record um you know if you really look you know if you got a pair of the odyssey headphones and a good headphone amp and a good dac yeah. if you listen for mouth clicks and ticks and just ticks from edits and who knows what else they're in there and i I consider those distractions. I mean, and to my ears, sometimes they sound like a, like it could be a digital tick, like a clocking error or something, you know, and I just don't want any of that in the masters I send out. And yeah, you know, one, th so yeah, I'm a big RX fan for all sorts of, you know, whether it's sometimes it's plosives that nobody heard in their smaller speakers. But then you, when I listen to my room, it's like, Oh yeah, there's a huge plosive on that word. And I can use RX pretty transparently, even on a stereo mix, you know, to remove stuff without damaging anything else. So everything gets an RX listen on the Odyssey headphones. Um, and it's extremely rare when I don't have to at least make one little fix on a song, let alone, and honestly, like a dozen or so fixes is about common for an average song. And then there's some songs that are like a few dozen because it's just mouth click city or yeah <laughs> or honestly sibilance you know mm -hmm. um i feel like s is you know people are using more saturation compression and mastering on cheaper mics 
this isn't a knock on cheaper mics, but when you add up like a cheap mic with a cheap preamp in an untreated bedroom with a bunch of plugins after that, someone's mixing on cheap speaker. I mean, the, the sibilance can just be out of control by the time it gets to me. And then mm -hmm. when I, Absolutely. when they expect me to make it louder mastering, it just jumps out more. And I have, you know, I have an analog DS or I have all the plugins in the world, but what works best, honestly, is RX. Just, it, it takes time. I have to listen in real time. And then when I hear an S that's too aggressive, I'll highlight it and tame it down a little bit, but it's honestly the most transparent, you know, de -esser. Cause you know, trying to find the right de -esser setting on a plugin, it might work for some of the S's, but not all of them. And it might be grabbing too much of the acoustic guitar or the tambourine or, you know, yeah. so RX is my favorite de -esser too. Um, I use it for sample. Yeah, it's it's a I couldn't wouldn't want to be without it at this point. You know, I don't know. It makes me wonder how we did stuff before RX. To be honest with you, I mean, I was more in the mixing phase back then than mastering before yeah. RX existed. But yeah, it's a essential tool in my book. I mean, there's no way I could master a record without it now. Brilliant, man. Thanks so much for that, Justin. Um, okay, so I think as well, what'd be great before we uh, maybe move on to some like kind of general technical questions as well and like see if people want to send through questions. We are live. Feel free to uh, fire some questions through to us. And um, let's maybe, do you want to have a look at your, your workflow first or should we have a look at all your gear? Which one do you want to go with, man? Um, what, do you, what do you prefer? Let's have a look at your gear. So let's, uh, okay. do you want to show us around and have a look at your yeah, let me fire your up. Let me fire up the studio cam. Let awesome, me just fire man. it up. I think you might have to add the stream. Let me in. Okay. Can you still Thanks hear that... my mic? Yeah. Okay, so I'll guess... remove myself off, man, so you can show everyone around. Okay. Well, let's start with the speakers. That's one of the more important parts in monitoring. Um, these are PSI audio. Um, a215 m's they're made in switzerland and i have sub i have two subs um there's one on the other side two subwoofers um great sounding speakers um not much else to say about them other than they sound fantastic and like i said so many version one approvals happen on them uh, i've got a lot of gik acoustic um, panels on the wall and on the back wall um, which is hard to show you without moving off mic, but I also have the PSI um, active bass traps, which are just kind of the icing on the cake for acoustic treatment. I guess let's start kind of at the heart of the studio, which is the uh, Crane Song Abisset and the Crookwood insert switcher. Um, the insert switcher lets me put any piece of gear in whatever order that I'd like. So you can see, maybe you can see the labeling. Um, it's basically like a patch bay, but without having to touch the move any cables. Similar to the dangerous liaison, except for, like I said, I can put the equipment in any order that I'd like. And it has some parallel processing. It has an elliptical filter. It has four inputs and outputs. So when I get to the converters, I will talk about that. But I can choose which converter is feeding the equipment, and then it spits it out to all four analog to digital converters so I can choose which one sounds best for the particular song or project in the DAW. So the Crane Song Avocet is just amazing for, I use it because it has the best um, digital to analog converter I've really heard and it lets me switch between sources whether it's my DAW, my Mac, um, my other DAW output for referencing, analog input for uh, vinyl i can switch between speakers and headphones or my little mono speaker um, so that's a great tool for a mastering room um, let's go down to the converters I'm trying to do this and stay on mic but to feed the equipment i have what let me think now i have three options i have the crane song head quantum so that's one that's the one i use the most to feed my analog chain over here, I have the Dangerous Convert 2. Don't use it as often to feed the analog chain, but it can sound nice. It has a little bit wider sound, and when you hear people talk about that on forums, you think they're just kind of bullshitting, but for whatever reason, it sounds wider than my other two D-Days, and it makes me wonder which one's more correct. But if I have a mix that's a little stuffy and not wide-sounding, sometimes that's the great 
choice to feed the gear because it kind of opens things up a little wider. But then there's times where it sounds too wide. So I don't know. It's strange. Um, and then you can't see it, but I have the RME ADI 2 Pro, which is another option to feed the analog gear, but it's hiding behind the desk. And then to capture from the analog gear, we'll just stay over here. Well, if, if you look below, you can see the Crookwood brain units. I just showed you the remote before, but there's three rack units that all my gear is connected to. So in the top, in the top of the bottom rack, it's the Dangerous AD Plus, which is an analog to digital converter. One of the choices I have for capturing the analog chain. Again, the Crane Song Head Quantum is another choice for capturing from the analog chain. And right above that, it might be a little dark, but it's the Neve, Rupert Neve Master Bus Converter, another option for capturing the analog chain. And then the RME, again, is another analog, analog to digital option. So there are four options there. Um, I have the Little Labs headphone monitor amp over there for uh, head, headphone listening. Really good headphone amp if you need one from Little Labs. So those are the converters and routing. So I guess let's get to the gear itself. We'll start with kind of the classic Mazalek MEA2, just a really classic parametric EQ with, of course, stepped um, pots for good. For, People think that these are good for recall, but what they're also good for is making sure your left and right channels are balanced. So if you want to boost a decibel of something in the right channel, you can boost exactly a decibel in the left channel, um, and they're perfectly matched. So that's a really good, clean-sounding EQ. It's pretty, you see it in a lot of mastering rooms. And I guess we're getting out of order, but above that is the Mazalek MDS-2. Uh, it's an analog ds -er. I usually have this last in the chain. In the analog world, I used to think that I could do all the DSing with plugins before going analog, but it's been nice to have this near the end of the chain. And then, of course, post capture, I'll do some RX DSing as well for the S's that are still bugging me. Above that is Buzz Audio SOCM, it's an optical compressor. It gets used on a, a handful of projects every week or month, it's just a different flavor of compression. And honestly, with compression, if I'm doing more than a decibel of compression, that's almost never happens. I'm very, doing very little actual compression. It's usually more about kind of the sound of the unit itself and how it handles some of the bigger transients, but not doing like more than a decibel of gain reduction in most cases. Above that is dangerous compressor. Um, not a character piece at all, but it's a really clean, modern sounding kind of hi-fi compressor. And that's true with all these. I'm very rarely doing any actual compression. It's more about the sound of the unit and the makeup gain that it has. I'm usually adding about three and a half decibels of makeup gain to feed back into my A to D. Above that, I didn't turn it on, I guess, because it gets pretty warm, but it's the Manly Very Mew. Very classic tube compressor. It doesn't get used a lot, but if I'm doing a traditional jazz record or something or a really warm kind of folk album that'll get used it's a nice but it's got a lot of a little too much color for most projects and it's kind of slow sounding let's go back to the bottom another mazalek piece the uh, mla4 multi-band compressor uh, analog it's one of the only analog multi-band compressors i know of and it's it's also an expander but i don't use the expansion very often but it's nice to have a little bit of taming of the low low end without um in the analog world so that's all i'll say about that got some meter some doro meters above that which aren't playing anything but the left meter plays whatever i'm listening to whether it's my daw streaming service the mac um, and if, if you were talking it would show your voice um on these meters so whatever i'm listening to on the avocet it is going to um, show on there. And then the right meter, this shows the level going into my analog chain, which is kind of nice to see how, how hot or how much level you're feeding into the analog chain because I have kind of a sweet spot. And we'll talk more about that when I open the DAW. Above that is the Vertigo Sound um, VSM2 made in Germany. Um, very nice harmonic kind of saturation unit and the reason i use it mastering is because it can be super subtle you know it's not like the decapitator plug-in or 
anything aggressive or um, egregious in Matt, you know, it's very subtle because you can blend, you can kind of decide which frequency range you're distorting, and then you can blend it into taste and you can roll off some of the high end. It's, it's, it's extremely subtle. The plugin from Plugin Alliance is pretty good too. That's what made me interested in the hardware. And the nice thing with the plugin is you can solo the distortion of the saturation and really refine it and then blend it into taste. And what I had um, Crispin from Crookwood do, you know, he made this insert switcher. He made a delta mode for me. So delta mode is you're basically hearing the difference of the signal. So I have a way where I can listen to just the saturation that this thing is adding and then again, blend it into taste. So it kind of works like the plugin does. It's kind of nice, but anyway, it's a great unit. Above that is the Neve, Rupert Neve Portico Master Bus processor. I get all their abbreviations mixed up, but just another compression option. Good for anything modern, pop rock. Um, what's nice about this one is it has a blend option. So I usually have it set to less than 100%. Um, so yeah, great sounding, somewhat general purpose compressor, not right for everything, but it's on one, one of my handful of options. Above that is the Dangerous Bax EQ, which is a very kind of specific shelving EQ. I consider it kind of a must for any mastering studio. It's kind of what I use, it's usually first in, in the line um, for basic filters and shelving. And then above that is the API 2500 compressor. I can't remember the last time I used this 100%, but I do sometimes mix it in parallel um, with whatever else I have going on on the Crookwood. The Crookwood has a parallel path, so I can, you know, send everything through the API and then kind of mix it in just for a little more oomph if it's if it needs it. You know, it's not something I use all the time. And at one point, this is my only compressor, but... Um, it's been probably a decade since I've run anything through it at 100% because it, it does have a sound and it's certainly not right for everything, but it's it's a nice unit, API 2500. So we're almost done here, but let's go to the side rack. I'll try to stay by the mic. Uh, what is in here? It's, I've, it's the Elysia, Elysia, however you want to say it, um, Expressor, which is just another compression option. Um, this is a more recent addition, but it's gotten a lot of use. And again, what I like is it has a blend, so you can blend it to less than 100%. Um, it has a warm mode, which is kind of a term I don't like, but I have used it when things are really, really thin and bright. The warm button kind of adds, you know, some low mids back. You know, something you can also do with an EQ, but once in a while, it's just right. And uh, yeah, so above that is a one of the the only other tube piece that I have is the uh, Giraffe G23S, and it's a tube EQ. It's a tilt EQ. There's the tilt, and um, so you can just kind of choose if you want to be brighter or darker. I think of it as like a brighter and darker knob right there, and then has three three bands, mid, low, and high, and there's purposely no numbers on them. Uh, you kind of got to use your ears if you want to add or subtract some low, mids, and highs. It's a really basic EQ, but one of those units that sounds good if you just run stuff through it flat, which, again, I know you read this online, it sounds kind of bogus, but it does have a nice sound just set flat. And it has a way to take it. Did we lose something? Yeah, I think it was just um, the hi man. Uh, yeah, it's just literally it's just like the uh, the camera it just went on your phone just for a sec. Yeah, somebody called me. Of course, nobody ever calls. <laughs> hey, we're live after all, so no, it's all good, man. Don't worry. It's let cool. Me, let me see what happens here if I refresh it. Yeah, it should work absolutely fine. We're getting near the end, and um, yeah, yeah, no worries, man. If uh, just let you know if you've just joined us, so uh, Justin has very kindly just shown us around his studio at the minute. So we're just literally looking at uh, his outboard gear. So what we're going to do, worth telling your friends as well, we're going to be looking at his uh, workflow in a moment. So I'm just going to skip off and add Justin's camera back up. There we go, Justin. All right. So we're almost done, but above the 2BQ is three better maker units, the limiter, EQ, and compressor. 
And the reason they're over here is because they have plugins that can control them. So I never actually touch these. They're just kind of over there. They're connected with USB. They are analog units, but again, I, I control them 100% with a plugin in the DAW. And the EQ gets a lot of use on almost every song. Compressor is kind of like the rest of them. It just depends if it's the right fit for a song or project. As you can see, the limiter is turned off. I turn it on about once or twice a month because um, I really don't, I don't, I don't like to commit back to digital with um, any limiting because I do a lot of stuff that goes to vinyl. It kind of paints you in a corner if you're going to limit something before going back in. So I rarely use it, but once in a while I'll be doing a single that just kind of sounds better with it, and I know it won't be going to vinyl, so I'll roll the dice and use it, but don't use the, the limiter a lot. It's not that it sounds bad, but I don't want to commit to that, and it's there's a lot of great digital limiters out there, so... That is just about the end of the studio tour. And there's a turntable over there for listening to test pressings, a DAT machine for DAT transfers. Um, and yeah, I think that's about everything. Um, awesome, Rob. That's so cool. Thanks for showing us around. Really appreciate that. That's brilliant. No problem. So good. Um, yeah, let's, um, let's have a look at your workflow then. So I know we've had a chat uh, about this um, over the past couple of days, you know, messages backwards and forwards. Um, and what's really interesting as well is the fact that you uh, use Reaper and you also use WaveLab as well. So it'd be really interesting just to see um, your workflow on the screen. I'm sure a lot of the um, our viewers will be really interested just to see what you've got going on as well and like your uh, how you how you master really. So yeah, let's have a look, man. If that's cool with you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I do use both. If people ask me what I use for mastering, I always say WaveLab because yeah, that is the tool that does the mastering specific things mm. obviously for wrapping up projects for rendering all the files i need the correct formats any metadata and also even though i just showed you all this gear um, i do a lot of stuff all digital where i don't use any analog gear cool. and for those projects i do them 100 percent in in wave lab i don't use reaper for that I, I really just use reaper to go through my analog chain okay because prior to wave lab 10 Going analog in WaveLab was not so easy. I thought it was really kind of clumsy. People were doing it, but I just, when I tried to do it, I was like, oh, I'm just going to keep using Pro Tools for that because I was using Pro Tools at the time because WaveLab really wasn't cut out for going analog. Starting with version 10, it's so much easier, and I know a lot of people have switched to it that were using um, SoundBlade, which is now basically extinct. It was yeah. a Mac. It was one of the better Mac options. WaveLab is one of the few Mac options for mastering um, specifically. And that's why I ended up using it because it was one of, it came to Mac about 11 years ago and I got it the very first day it came out and I've been working with it since. But um, in that time, you know, in the time that WaveLab was getting better at analog, I just developed this really specific Reaper workflow and set of scripts. You know, I probably, I spent more money on Reaper scripts than I have on, you know, WaveLab itself, or I probably could have purchased Sequoia for the amount I've spent on uh, Reaper scripts, yeah. <laughs> but it, it helps me work faster, better, more efficiently, cool. more accurately. So it's worth it. But yeah. basically I have this Reaper setup that I'm just not ready to give up because I'm just so efficient in it. And I know it may seem weird to use two DAWs, but for me, I get to the end result faster, better, smoother, with less stress. Um, the software is more transparent and out of my way where I can just focus on the music. So, and even if I did use WaveLab 100%, which I'm sure I will someday uh, for analog work, I would still be doing it in two, I would have a montage for like the analog workflow and then I'd have a finalization montage to like render everything out. So to me, yeah. I don't even really care what software it is to some degree because I just care about what it does. So. Yeah. Well, it might seem slower to use two apps. To, I think I get the job done faster and better because I'm using each one for what they're really best at. And if you're watching this and have never used WaveLab, like I said, I know a lot of people that use WaveLab 10 and now WaveLab 11 for for 100% of the job and they use analog gear. It's totally can do it now. There's no problem there like there was prior to 10. But like I said, for me, I, I'm a kind of a creature of habit too. I just... Um, I haven't had time to like stop and think about the best way to do it with wave lab. And there's a couple 
things that um, I, I've scripted. I, I've Reaper scripted so precisely that I would I would lose a few things, and and also related to the Better Maker stuff. Are you familiar with Better Maker? Yeah, yeah, Better Maker is amazing, man. It's great. Yeah, so it's cool stuff. Um, the plugin controls the hardware. I think when they designed it, they they had an oversight. Um, I think it was designed from a mix engineer standpoint rather than mastering because yeah. you can, of course, put a plug-in in your DAW and it controls the hardware. And more importantly, it recalls the settings when you open that session. So if you have to revisit it tomorrow or in a year, you can open your session of any DAW and the plug-in will tell the hardware what to be. And, and that's because most mix engineers mix, you know, one song per session. So, you know, here's song A. Let's open the session. The hardware does its thing. It's great. Let's mix song B. But what they didn't think about is mastering engineers have all the songs in one session usually, right? You know, um, yeah. and mastering programs tend to have what they call clip effects or object effects or item effects where you're putting plugins not even on a track but right on an actual piece of audio. That's how most mastering programs are structured, if not all of them. And it's part of what defines them as a mastering software versus mixing or recording. But what, what Better Maker didn't think about is you can only have one instance of the plugin per session. So that means if you, and this isn't a knock on WaveLab, but let's say I open up WaveLab and I want to have this EQ setting for song one and this EQ setting for song two or the compressor, whatever, the hardware doesn't support it. Yeah. It doesn't know what to do because there's more than one plugin open. I had a script made where whatever, so in Reaper, I put effects right on each song and I put the Better Maker, a Better Maker plugin on each song and whichever song is closest to the cursor, that's the one that's online. And Reaper has a way to put plugins offline where they're, they don't lose their settings, but they're not technically there. It's like off, I guess it's offline. It's, it's not like bypass, it's offline where the, you can't even see the GUI. Yeah. But anyway, so that script makes it so that I can hop around from song to song in my mastering session and the better maker will change just for that song. Whether I'm comparing and dialing things in or if I'm printing the whole record, when it goes from song one to two to three, it changes automatically. And that's not possible in any other program unless you get into some automation and scenes but to me, that's too clunky. It's like that the whole point of the hardware to me is to use it. So I use the hardware like a plugin, basically. So that's honestly a significant reason why I'm still in Reaper, not because of WaveLab, but because of how Better Maker designed their plugins. And yeah. I hope they come up with an update that supports more than one instance in a session where that, if you're playing this song, it'll switch to that setting if you're playing the other one. But without automation and scenes, which is to me just a little too fiddly and too much messing around to make it worthwhile. Um, that's why another reason why I'm in Reapers because I can dial in a whole record or EP usually with specific settings, and then I can print it all at one time, which means I can really fine tune up until the last minute. Because with my old workflow, you know, I would dial in the first song, it sound pretty good. Go to song two, three, then maybe by the time I get to song four or five, I listen to the first one. I'm like, oh, I want it. It should be a little brighter. So then I have to change the settings, make it a little brighter, re-record it three or four minutes. Um, that's to me a little bit inefficient way to work in 2021. So I get it to where I can dial everything in globally. And I, it's not that I use the same setting on every song. Every song has its own setting for sure, but I don't commit to it until I'm happy with every song. Yeah. And then it commits in one pass. And thanks to the automation of the plugins for better maker and the crookwood has midi capability so it can change its settings its insert settings per song with midi nice it's 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 kind of the best of both worlds it's like having plug-in recall and automation to some degree with still using analog equipment yeah. so anyways i can show you some of that once i open reaper but i just wanted to preface it with if i could only choose one piece of software reaper or wave lab i'd have to choose wave lab because it's so much yeah. better at the actual task of mastering sure 100 it's just still getting up to speed with the analog side and again i know like bob weston and the guys at chicago mastering are using wave lab now i know a lot of bigger and veteran mastering studios that are 
moving over to Wave Lab now, and they're using their analog gear, and everything's fine. It's just, I, I guess, basically, I'm just really picky about my workflow. Like, it drives me nuts if something isn't the best it can be, and um, yeah. And it's not that Wave Lab isn't the best it can be, but with all these scripts, I, I don't do the scripting, but I know a guy. He reached out to me on the Reaper forum and said, "Hey, I do scripting," and he has done a ma any little crazy idea I get. Like, here's a repetitive task I always do. Can we script it? Um, he's like, "Yeah." And then a few days later, he sends me a script. I send him a PayPal, and my life just got a little easier. And it's just all these little incremental improvements that I just not ready to give up yet. So maybe I just need some time to migrate some of that to Wave Lab and wait for Wave Lab to add a couple minor requests. But anyways, um, that's a long story there. But yeah, Wave no, Lab that's is cool, man. That's great. Wave Lab is my, I guess, go to mastering DAW, especially you know in the box masters yeah. and finalizing. Reaper is just this weird, and and I don't use Re I don't think I want to mix a record in Reaper or record. It seems kind of weird, but I'm using it in a very specific way which i'll show you which for me works out and it honestly took me two or i would say three or four failed attempts before reaper made sense i kept hearing yeah. about how good it was and stuff and i'm open it up and be like ah, i don't know but basically it's so much of a blank slate that you kind of have to like devote some time and figure out how do you want to use it um you know how do you want it to look how do you want it to operate you kind of it's not like pro tools where pro tools is kind of structured around a classic mixing console and um, yeah and that's fine too for that i'm, I'm not I, I use pro tools for a certain client um, not anti pro tools but with reaper it's such a blank slate that it can be hard to dive in because of it's just kind of an open canvas but anyway should, did i do we miss anything or should i open up reaper Mammoths, yes, go for it. I think before we do that, I think it's just really interesting as well with, obviously I know you use Reaper for a purpose, but I think what really interests me is the fact that as well as like a kid, you know, or someone maybe just starting off in the world of audio, or I even know some professionals that use just Reaper and that's it. And it's just amazing that for like, what is it, like $60, whatever it is that, you know, someone can actually get, you know, a DAW to start them off, which is just absolutely amazing. But then they can then dive into, like you said, like it's Wave Lab at a later point as well. I think it's just a, a great thing that people can do. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's basically two guys that develop it. I've had a feature request added in hours or bugs fixed within hours, which is amazing. Yeah. Because they do, they do a lot of pre-release versions. Um, it's extremely efficient and stable app. Um, the installer is, I don't even, I have pretty fast internet, but by the, when I click download, it's already fully downloaded by the time I can get to my downloads folder. It just downloads. Yeah. The installer is so tiny, <laughs> um, which is cool when you're updating. But yeah, I mean, mm. it's so great at many things. It struggles in the, fin and I know there are people that, that finalize their masters in Reaper. I just can't do it because it, it, I've tried. It drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. And I also don't, I don't want to rely on scripts for the important tasks of like finalizing you know i can handle it for the heavy lifting you know sure because because i quality control check all that i listen through it and there's never an issue but i don't want to rely on scripts for like spitting out the final masters and all the details because if yeah. that script breaks who do i talk to if the person isn't that made it is no longer available yeah um, and I, so i need wave i need something like wave lab for like the finalization the you know to me, I just I can't rely on scripts for the final tasks, but um, and yeah, you know, Wave Lab just does some great things. Like, and I know Reaper can do just about anything, but Wave Lab does it more elegantly. Like, I've seen a video on how to make a DDP in Reaper, but it like it makes my head explode. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wave Lab, Wave Lab can make really nice P um, PDF reports for vinyl masters, where it not only tells you where each song starts, but for so, any almost any program can make a pdf report of where the track markers are but yeah a mastering program is going to like start over for side b because side b starts at zero right when you make that wave file for side b and side c and d of a big album collection sure the re, the track times need to start over at zero again they can't if you're telling the cutting engineer that song three on side b starts at 27 minutes they're going to be like no it doesn't it starts at seven minutes because that's where the it, it's i'm getting kind of in the weeds but yeah. Reaper's a great tool for processing but it's not really cut out for the
the final stages of mastering, in my opinion. But it all depends yeah, on what, sure. what do we consider mastering. Some people think mastering is the stereo bus processing and nothing else. If we're talking about the automated services, you know, they don't even do any of the final quality control, putting the no. songs in order. So what yeah. we have to we have to decide what is mastering? Is it stereo bus processing? Because you can do that in FL Studio if you want to. Yeah, uh, but the the final detailed, less exciting steps. That's where a program like Wave Lab or you know, the mastering specific programs, that's where they, they still serve a purpose, in my opinion. It's not just for CDs. It's for anything, really. Anything that, anything yeah. beyond a digital single would drive me crazy to do outside of WaveLab. So we'll talk about WaveLab, too, but I guess I can show you Reaper first. Yeah, let's do it, man. Let's go for it. So I've done a little, uh, and you know what? Does this ever happen to anyone? I can't see my doc. Um, I don't know if it's because of our streaming, but like the doc isn't there. So I think I got to open it this way. Yeah, no problem, man. It's weird. That's cool. Yeah, it's take your time. So uh, I did I did a little, um, how do I want to do this? This is what an album looks, I, I just did an EP because it's shorter, same concept. This is an EP that I've printed through my analog chain. And I, I should, I'll probably have to back up a little bit, but. Yeah, let me back up. Let me do, I'm going to show you this in a minute. This is how I would start a new project. Okay. I have a dummy folder from a thing I did. I did a WaveLab live stream yesterday. Oh, cool. So, so yeah, I, have yeah. a, I have kind of a dummy project folder set up here for a, a fake project, but a, a real, you'll get the idea. So, you right. know, I have the, I have a folder for each band or artist. I have a folder for the album. So I'm going to make my initial reaper session it's all it's a template everything's templates and not not in the sense that for sounds but for layout and routing everything is a template yeah okay. so i've just made a this is an empty project so i'm gonna load in the files i need and if if these were not 96k basically anything that is 44 1 and 48k i i upsampled at 96 yeah i know that's kind of controversial i should probably share my screen cool man yeah let's do it I'm amateur at live streaming. If you can, no man, no, 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 you're doing great. It's brilliant. It's so good. Uh, right, so I'll add it to the live now for you. There you go, mate. So basically, I, I talked about, it, but now you can see I've created just the em empty Reaper project, and anything that isn't. So if something's eighty-eight point two, I'll I'll make an eighty-eight point two session. A lot of things yeah. come in at forty-four one and forty-eight, and I upsample it to ninety-six and. Of course, the upsampling doesn't make it sound better, but I think my processing sounds better. I think it's better. I think it sounds better to work in a higher resolution environment. Um, I think whether it's the plugins or the analog chain, the everything I've done tests, I prefer this way. Not everybody does. It's kind of political, but I upsample everything to 96. If it comes in at 82, I'll work on it there. I have one client that sends stuff at 192K and I'll process it at that sample rate so i always have the highest resolution available if he wants it yeah anyways this is the 96k session and the files that the mix has happened to already be 96 so i didn't have to change anything so i'm going to load these in to the session and um, the, the blue track is where i put the unmastered mixes and the red track is where i'm going to record them back to and i have I have a project management app. I'm not going to open that because it's got a lot of projects I should be working on today. But um, I just put it in a little Apple note. So that's the song order. We're just doing a pretend EP. So Candlestick Park is first. That's second. That's third. So right away, I put the songs in the correct order. Um, and I have, I have a little, this is another little Reaper script I made where I'm pressing a certain key command and it's switching the songs in order. That, that's not native to Reaper. I'm just pressing a certain shortcut. Cool. Uh, this shortcut selects the file and another shortcut actually moves it. So that's a really quick way to just sequence the songs, which I think I just screwed up. But all this stuff I can do very quickly when I'm not talking about it. So that is the song order. And what's going to happen here? I'm going to press one button on the stream deck. I didn't show you the stream deck or the Clarity M in my video. I forgot, but I use a stream That's deck. Cool. Yeah. So what's going to happen here um, very quickly, and I have to open. I'm having a bunch of weird um, things that don't normally happen, but I'm going to open the 
the stream deck app wasn't open but okay so i'm gonna press one button on the stream deck and it's gonna set this session up for me right now i don't care how loud the songs are i don't care how they're right now there's no space between them but i'll, pr I'll press this button and watch how fast it goes that's crazy so what it's doing here is <laughs> no way. it just made a marker for each song so i can press yeah. one two three four five on my keypad yeah. skip to the start of it yeah it, it put 10 seconds of space between the songs and i know that's a lot but i'm not i don't care about this song spacing right now i'm going to do that in wave lab i actually prefer to leave a bigger space because um it just leaves buffer for my analog gear to change settings um leaves room for things to change and it also leaves room for if the band says or the engineer says oh um the file we sent was cut off by like a few seconds where here's a new file you know the guitar just chopped off because that happens all the time it leaves a little wiggle room for when they send a new file if it's got a little more of a tail or something so yeah. anyways that's a random time i picked but 10 seconds between the songs because why not i'll deal with the song spacing later the other thing it did and this is something wave lab can do but it also it normalized the songs to a certain level and not it didn't peak normalize them because that's kind of useless but what it did is it measured the the lufs so it set it set it and these songs look they don't they don't look extremely dynamic so it wasn't maybe the best example but what it did is it set the the maximum short-term lufs of each song to the same level so basically the loudest part of each song is hitting the same level automatically for me i didn't have to and i, I of course listen to it and use my ear to fine tune it but this gets me 98 percent there so right now if i just played through this and didn't even touch anything everything would sound like a natural cohesive level i wouldn't be tempted to adjust my playback level so awesome. i think that's so people think of normalization like as a ending thing, like for streaming services and whatever, but I think it's most useful to get started. Whether I'm in the box in WaveLab or analog, the first thing I do typically is normalize each song to the same maximum short-term LUFS, which again means the third chorus or the bridge is whatever the loudest part is, the densest part is hitting the same level. And that gets me a really good starting point. Um, and in, in this case, it's a level that I've determined to be the sweet spot for feeding my analog chain. So I don't have to like stress out about, am I hitting the gear too hard? Am I not hitting it hard enough? I just figured out one day that this is where I like to hit. I have a whole structured gain kind of situation happening here where I rarely change any output gain of anything. It's all fairly fixed because I'm feeding it a, a nice, consistent, healthy level that I've determined to be good. So um, that's another, that's one thing the script did. The other thing, cool. it, the other thing it did is it made, I have a, a hidden track down here called raw. Yeah. After that gain adjustment, it made a copy of each song on a different track. And this raw track is feeding a different digital output. So as I'm working, I can compare what I'm doing with what it sounds like without any plugin processing before going analog. Yeah. And of course, without any analog processing. So I'm able to AB, you know, what I'm doing to it versus what it originally sound like. And it's, I don't want to say it's a hundred percent level match, but since I tend to print back in at a relatively similar level, um, it's very closely level match. And I'm able to decide if I'm making something better or worse. I'm also able to determine if, if I hear some distortion or something sounds funky, I can yeah. listen to the original and say, well, that was in the mix. And not that we don't have to address it, but I can, it helps me know if I'm adding some, something that's bad or if it was part of the original mix. So within a split second, I can toggle between my processing work and the original file. So it puts that on the, and I never even look at that track. That's why I was kind of off screen. Yeah. So, um, Man, this doc thing is very weird that I can't see it, but um, what is that called? Total mix. Kind of the, the heart of my studio, not the studio, the heart of my routing is this yeah. RME AES card. Oh, cool. It is a PCIe card with eight stereo AES ins and outs. So these are just digital ins and outs. 
there's no converters on this thing yeah but as you can see i just it's it's hard to explain but um these are all my converters for feeding the analog chain and then for listening and then converters for capturing this is kind of my whole routing scheme and i some mastering studios will use one computer for playing the audio into the chain and another computer to record back. Yeah. I think that's somewhat old school because yeah, there was a time when you didn't want the capture computer to be too stressed out because it could have a dropout or a crackle or, you know, couldn't handle it. I think for almost eight years now, I've been doing everything on one computer. Um, and the reason I like that aside from it only having one computer is when I do print it back in, my playback and record timeline is the same. Um, when, you know, I, which is really handy. I'll explain why when I get to that point. But anyways, that's my awesome. um, kind of routing scheme. Is I mean, the, the, this RME card is sort of like the unsung hero of the studio here because it's just so f flexible with routing and it's extremely stable. I never have a dropout or a click or a, some sort of digital issue. It's just remarkably stable. Yeah. And my main clock is the crane song head quantum that I showed you. Yep. It's the main clock for everything. Aside from sounding amazing, that unit has six word clock outputs that can just feed everything. So it's kind of a no brainer to use that as the clock. So the reason I showed you this is because this blue track with the unmastered mix. Now I don't dig into here very often because I just set it and forget it, but yeah. This track is feeding all three of my DACs that go to the analog chain at the same time. So whatever I do on this track, it's feeding the head quantum, it's feeding the RME, um, not the obviously not the uh, PCI card, but it's feeding my RME ADI2 Pro, whatever it's called, the little black interface. Yep. And then it's feeding the dangerous. So it's feeding all three DACs at the same time. And then on my Crookwood is where I determine which one is going to feed the analog chain. And they all sound really good. They all sound slightly different. And it depends on the material as far as which one I choose. You know, I just find that when you're able to A-B it in an instant without repatching, without any disruptions, I mean, I can literally play the song and toggle between them without disrupting any playback and... I can really hear the difference of, oh, this one's a little more favorable for this record or this song. So that is a nice feature. So I'm feeding them all at the same time from this track. Um, yeah, and then the kind of what I talked about earlier is in mastering programs, we use item effects, object effects, clip effects, all the same same thing. Reaper is one of the few mixing programs I know of that has item effects. It's probably great for sound design too, because I can literally put a plugin right on this file. I don't, ha I don't put plugins on tracks in Reaper. I mean, I'm sure you've seen people mastering and they have a stair step of tracks and the waveforms are like a centimeter. And yeah. it's very inefficient visually, but also <clears throat> depending on your software and how it works, you can max out your CPU very quickly because now you've got, if you're doing a 12 song album, You've got 12 tracks with some heavy duty plugins on each one. By the time you get every song going, it's bogging down your computer, even a good computer. Yeah. With Reaper, aside from it being really efficient, it only taxes the CPU when I'm playing whatever song it is. So I can put an insane plugin chain on each song if I wanted to. And the CPU is barely breaking a sweat because it's not caring about these at that time. It's they're offloaded. So Brilliant. what I do here is I put, I have a starting point plugin chain, which doesn't have any, it's not doing anything in particular, but the plugins are ready for me. So I'll start off by listening and I can play. Ooh, can you hear that too? The music that I played? Um, no, I'm not getting the audio through here. Oh, okay. There we go. I don't want you to hear it. I just want to make sure you couldn't hear it. Cause I don't have, oh, cool. <laughs> I don't, I don't have permission. <laughs> I had the wrong thing set. So cool. what I'll do is I will, like I said, by even though this did 98% of the starting point, yeah. I like to, uh, I like to, and I'm sorry if you asked a question, I didn't respond. I, I didn't have your microphone in my headphones, so I wasn't ignoring Oh that. man, it's fine. Don't worry at all. Um, uh, yeah, it's cool. So um, aside from just making sure the levels still feel nice, like from song to song, and again, I haven't even started working yet. This is just as a starting point. 
Yeah. Um, I'll usually pick the first song that I want to start with. And it's a combination of like, what's the loudest, most dense song slash what is the best or one of the better mixes slash what is not the weirdest. I don't want to start with the oddball song. You know, if, if I'm doing a, a rock album that has an acoustic track at the end, I will definitely not start with the acoustic track, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so I'll pick the first song to start with. And again, I, I'm not even listening to this. I'm just kind of going by uh, visuals today. Cool. But um, let's say I pick this song first. And again, I have a, I have a plug-in chain that goes pre-analog that I like to start with. And I'll show you what it is. It's not a big secret. It, it looks like a lot of plugins, but they're all set flat to start with. They're not doing anything. Yeah. They might be at f common frequency points that I like to address but they're not actually boosting or cutting or doing anything. Cool. And then the, the three, the three better maker, the, the three plugins down here, that I don't have a check mark. These are the better maker plugins that are talking to the hardware. So these aren't even um, processing audio. They're just there in case I use those pieces of hardware. Yeah. And um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll listen to it and say, what does it need? You know, does it even need anything pre analog? Um, you know, again, these are all set flat. I like Soothe. I like this Weiss ds but as you can see, the threshold's cranked way up, so it's really not touching anything Yeah. Um, until I decide to do something. So I'll listen to it, and sometimes I'll immediately reach for some digital correction before I even insert anything analog. Um, and I wanted to say that you know I'm monitoring through this red track, so you can see the record button's lit. You can see the levels coming back in. Yeah. I'm listening through my Avocet. I'm listening to when the round trip i'm listening to the digital um capture of it and i also i, I talked about not committing to limiting reaper, uh, reaper and wave lab have this they have what's called monitor effects or playback processing these are plugins that are only working on playback but if you render your files they're not it's not part of that process it, it's basically literally called I think playback processing is a good word. That's what WaveLab calls it. So I, yeah. am I am monitoring through a little bit of limiting, and I use Limitless because it's a little more forgiving. Now, this might not be the limiter I use on the final master, but it's adding, you know, as you can see, two and a half decibels of, of gain, or that's where the threshold is at, just to give me a rough idea of what does it sound like when it's limited. And I don't capture with that limiter. It's just literally for listening. And when I'm in WaveLab is when I'll decide, do I use Limitless? Do I use FabFilter Pro L2? Do I use something else? Those are the kind of the two I mainly use. But this just gives me a rough idea of what happens when it is limited. Because I, like I said, I capture everything unlimited and I export everything from Reaper unlimited. It'll have a whole lot of other stuff that I'll show you. Cool. But there's no limiting because I don't want to be stuck in a corner of having it limited and when I'm in WaveLab, that allows me to make the vinyl master because I can just ease up or remove the limiting. I, it allows me to make a master that's a little bit louder or a little bit less loud without backtracking too far. Yeah. So I, I don't, right now we're just listening to the limiting for fun. So anyways, I will decide what does this need? It could be a, an immediate digital correction. Like there's way too much low mids. So I need to open up an EQ and, um, you know, carve that out or something. And again, this is happening pre-analog. Um, it could be something like, let me audition the DACs and see which one sounds better to feed the gear. Um, again, I usually have a favorite. It's not like a night and day thing, but there's a slight favorite usually. Um, so, Or it could be, if the mix already sounds really amazing, I might start adding a little bit of analog for some color, things like that, so I can... Let's see, this has already got something set, but now it's cleared. You know, I could say, oh, I want this piece in, and this one sounds good, and I'll put the Better Maker EQ in, and the DSR. I can basically just decide what pieces I want to use, and I, I, you know, I, I tend to use a similar. I kind of know what I like, basically. I know what works. It's not every, every project is not an experiment. It's kind of like I know what works well for this kind of music or that, or if a little bit needs to happen, if a lot needs to happen, I usually know where to go. So I'll add in what I want to add in analog and make see where it's hitting level wise. Um, I have the meters I told you about. Um, yeah. 
So I just kind of listen. I get the first song to where I'm happy with it. And let me show you the Better Maker plugin. You know, let's say let's say I want a little bit of more snap and sizzle. You know, if it's dull mix, I can um, do something like that. If it needs a little more bottom end, I can do that. If it's got too much low mids, I can cut it out. This is actually controlling the hardware. It's not a plugin. I mean, it is a plugin, but it's not processing through the plugin. It's controlling the hardware. Yeah. And let's say, you know, I love that. And same with the compressor. I, I don't know if I don't have it inserted. I could insert it there. You know, I can dial in the threshold, tack, release. The better maker has a blend knob too, which is nice. It could be less than 100%. And anyway, let's say I'm happy with it. Um, I might say, okay, that song sounds pretty good. Let me t tackle some of the other songs, see how they fit in. And if it's a case where, you know, everything sounds fairly similar, what I can do is, and and the thing with Reaper is another scripting thing where I can load a specific plugin chain that has already said how I like it. Now a script that I have is going to copy the, the plugin chain that's on this song too, it's going to copy that to the other songs for me while I grab a sip of water. So in a, in a split second, I have the same plugin chain on, um, on all the other songs. And obviously I wouldn't just use that. I need to listen to them and decide, <clears throat> you know, what, ne what needs to happen specifically for this song. And, you know, it could be that this doesn't need this, this didn't have too much low mids and this one didn't need any sizzle added. So maybe I can even bypass the whole EQ. You um, know, I have a, a multi-band, which I really only use the first, I really only use the first and second band on this. I don't really do a lot of multi-band work, but yeah, my point is I get every song sounding and I can skip around and the better maker units are changing. And if I had some MIDI programmed on the Crickwood, it would be changing. You know, per song, I can just skip around and be like, "Yep, that's good." Then I can skip to this one and say, "Up, oh, sounds a little thin. Let's let's add some bottom end, or it sounds a little loud." You know, I can nudge up in quarter dB increments. I can feed a little more into the analog chain, or a little less with shortcuts. Yeah. Um, I can do automation if I had to, if I wanted to boost up this intro. And yeah, um, so this is kind of my. I consider this kind of like my sandbox where I make a big mess and get everything sounding how I want it to sound. And another thing I can do is toggle between the A to D inputs. I'm yep. pressing it. This is another script I had made. I don't know if you can see it changing up in this area. It's changing between Neve to the head, to the RME, to the dangerous. Yeah, I can say that. I can listen in real time and say, oh, there's my, I like this one the best. It sounds best for this song. And then Sometimes it's the best one for the whole record, but I can get really detailed and say, I, I can drop markers. So let's say I like the Neve for song one, or sorry, song two. Yeah. But I like the head for song one. I can drop, you can see it's a green marker because Crane Song's theme is kind of green. Uh, I, I chose black for the Neve. Dan if, if I wanted the Dangerous to capture song three, I could drop an orange marker for Dangerous. And I don't know why I chose blue for the RME, but my point is I can automate inputs per song. And then whatever song I skip to, you'll see the input changing in the left corner, just change from yeah. head to Neve. So now I can really just jump around and be like, okay, this, you know, and I'm just listening kind of like a maniac, like, okay, this song doesn't quite feel like the other ones. What's missing? What does it need? How do we get it to match and feel good with the rest of them? and skip around just dropping the playback cursor obviously starting from the top of the song as well to see how that sounds but really it's just a lot of comparative listening and again i used to do this and in some projects i still have to because the mix is so different but i've gotten to a point where i can kind of find an analog chain that works well for the record again it's not really doing any compression because stuff's already pretty compressed um I can kind of find a global setting in the analog realm because of how my fixed my gain staging is and um, really just manage it in Reaper or WaveLab if I was using WaveLab you know, on the clip effects themselves. Um, it just helps me dial in and then I'm not committing one song at a time, which is really, you know, how we used to do it. And a lot of people still do that, but 
and I'm not even trying to save time, but I, I just much prefer being able to skip around until the last minute. You know, because what if what if I liked this song when I was working on it first, but as I did the rest of the record, I realized, oh, I guess all the other songs have a brighter feel. I need to brighten up song two, or whatever it needs. You know, I just I just love the flexibility of hopping around here, and that's where the item effects come in so handy because basically each song has its own plug-in chain, whether it's analog or digital or both. Um, every song has its unique setting. Um, and I could even choose, and, and all the converters sound good. It's just a matter of color or taste. It's like none of those A to D options sound bad, but yeah. there's one that might sound a little more favorable. And I can also do it where I can have one, you know, the, the Neve and the Head and the Dangerous, actually, they all have some sort of transformer or color option on them to some degree. So if I'm doing a record that was mixed by a few different people in one, and some of the mixes are really clean and some are a little dirtier. You know, I can set up a converter that's kind of the dirtier converter to dirty up some of the clean songs or add some saturation. But then I can have one converter that's totally clean that doesn't make the already saturated songs oversaturated. So it's really flexible in how I can automate the inputs. Um, the only plugin running on the track is just the dither plugin because um, it gets kind of debatable if it's even necessary but i'm kind of with bob Katz on this where it's like chicken noodle soup you know it can't hurt <laughs> yeah so because Absolutely. i'm doing because i'm doing processing here these even <clears throat> if the source files were 16 or 24 bit because i'm doing digital processing as you can see the bit def meter it's floating point audio yeah. so i argue and some others do that you should dither it to 24 bit before it comes out the converter just to I don't think it's going to hurt. I think it can only help. So that's the only plugin running on the track, but otherwise everything is item effects, which again, I think is so important. And as you can see, my, my CPU performance, wow, I can't even get there. There's something about this. I don't know what it is, but I can't reach the very lower edge of my screen right now. It might be because of the streaming app, but yeah, I, essentially, yeah. My, my CPU performance is like 4%, even though I'm at 96 K and have number of plugins. Um, it's barely taxing the CPU because of being item effects. And as I skip from song to song, let's see, you can kind of see here, does it zoom in for you when I do that? Yeah, it does. Well, that's great. Um, so these better maker plugins, th those are little Z's cause they're sleeping. Those better maker plugins are offline. That was for the first song. So now the hardware knows to look at the plugins for song two so again this is only possible in reaper with scripting unfortunately because yeah. of how better maker designed it unless you do automation which i don't want to do but anyways i hop around from song to song and make sure that everything feels good and as loud as i want it to be i tend to, you know there's no hard rules but i tend to print back in between minus 14 and minus 11 lufs integrated depends on the nature of the song and what it needs to sound like but to me once you get beyond like minus 13 or 14 lufs that's when you're having to start to do some limiting or clipping to get any louder and of course my final masters are louder than that but i don't want to commit i don't want to commit to anything that's limited or clipped because it's not vinyl friendly it paints me into a corner so yeah. that's that's about where i tend to print in most pop rock modern now if it's a if it's a folk album, I may not even go analog. You know, if it's classical, I definitely won't go analog. Um, things like that. But I tend to not print back in too hot anymore because it just paints you into a corner. Um, so I kind of just make sure everything feels good. And then again, also feels good with this little bit of limiting added, which again, is just, I call it rough limiting or monitoring limiting. You know, it's, so I'm actually listening to it pretty close to the final level it's going to be, but it's printed in without any limiting or, or clipping. Is that confusing at all or is that? No, it makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great. So unless you have any questions on any of that, let me think here. Um, I'll show you, I have one more session I'm gonna open before I move to Wave Lab. Cool. Because once I'm happy with this, I, I also have a test tone, which you can't see, but at the start of my session, it's on a hidden track. Yeah. But that, that's, I'm playing, I'm looping a test. I have a shortcut to loop this test tone this test tone will let me know if my left-right balance is off. 
if there's any clocking issues, which thankfully with the RME, there's never, but I used to have a Lynx card and there was a lot of times there'd be clocking issues and I have to reset the thing and mm-hmm. it was a lot of babysitting. So this little, um, test tone that I'm looping just lets me double check my left, right balance is perfect. There's no clocking problems. Nothing weird is happening. And then I also print that test tone because it comes in handy for recalls. Um, yeah. So once I'm happy with everything, I, I, a lot of times, I mean, I record everything back in in one pass because I'm really happy with how this sounds. I don't have to go song by song. So I'll hit a shortcut. It'll record. I will go grab a bite to eat, let the dog outside, go for a little walk, something like that while this records. Because, you know, this is a short little EP, but if we're doing a whole record plus instrumentals, you know, that can be a long cat. That can be a long real time process. So absolutely. So, so we don't have to sit here and look at the screen for 20 minutes. What I did is before we went earlier today, I did a, just a mock capture. So again, with the, with the scripting, <coughs> excuse me, with the scripting, one other thing I did is I put this marker at the end and what this marker at the end does is uh, a, a lot of things you can see. This is technically one long file, this red file. Yeah, but what it did is it trimmed up everything to the original lengths of the songs for me as a starting point, so I don't have to do any trimming. I mean, I'll, I'll do some trimming, but it gets me back to where I was. Um, the other thing it did is it it took all the plugins and put them offline because now that I've recorded everything in, I don't need these plugins to be running live, and now the program is more responsive because it's not running any plugins on the source track. And what else did it do? Oh, it also saves and quits Reaper for me. So if I'm not around, Reaper's not just sitting there open and wide open. Because if, if it would decide to crash or go to sleep, I wouldn't lose any work. So it quits. It does so many things. Um, that's where you can go down a scripting rabbit hole with Reaper. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then what I would do is um, then I listen. This is where I listen through everything on headphones. But I also trim up the heads and tails. I could still do more of this in WaveLab, but I get some basics, you know, if, if I decide I need to taper this, get some basic trimming done. Um, and I won't do all the songs, but you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. And again, if I have to crossfade any songs, I do that in, Re- in WaveLab. But the main thing I wanted to show you here is what I do is when, it's, after it's captured, this is when I do my RX work. And the reason I do it after is because I... Um, if I were to, if I needed to redo or rework any RX work, I would have to go back to the analog stage and then recapture from analog. It's a lot of backtracking. So I prefer to cap, I prefer to do the RX work after the analog capture, but before, of course, my final limiting. Yeah. Uh, and I also think it jumps out more. If you take an unmastered mix and try to clean it with RX, you'll hear some things, but some things aren't going to pop out as much until after you've raised the average loudness and kind of, done the mastering thing so anyways i'll I'll listen through and i I didn't have time to make a perfect example but if i heard a mouth click i could highlight it press a shortcut and it's going to open just a copy of that section in rx9 as an external editor brilliant and let's say that's a mouth click i could de-click it i could however you want to do it i know that's not a mouth click but let's say it was okay it's gone save it close now when i pop back to reaper this is the original audio, and then this is the fixed audio. So now, if somebody says, hey, I really wanted that mouth click in there, all I have to do is toggle back and get it. It's, it's back in a split second. I don't have to, like, recall the analog gear. That's any, so cool. Any, sometimes I listen through and find clicks and pops or sharp S sounds yeah. and remove them. And um, it can be anywhere from a, a handful to dozens per song. So... I won't bore you with that, but as you can see, the songs get pretty, it's a really fast process. And why I do that is, you know, I, I, I can't in good conscience run mouth declick on the whole song because it's going to affect some transients in the song. Yeah. I want to really only process the small sections that need it, whether it's a plosive or a click. I'm just doing really micro sections. But as you can see, now the song is chopped up into a mess, right? 
Yeah. It's, it's no longer a continuous file. So what I, I had another script made where I c can copy the song title from my project management app, press one key, and now it just made a region with the song title. And the region is the exact length of what I trimmed it up to be. And it adds 200 milliseconds of digital silence to the start. And this comes in handy when I get to WaveLab and sequence the record. Because you usually want, unless songs are overlapping, you want maybe 200 milliseconds of digital silence between the start of the track and the first downbeat or first sound. Yeah. Um, and having that baked into the file just means I don't have to play around with the markers as much in WaveLab. Because if, if WaveLab makes a CD marker at the start of the file, it's got this little buffer built in. You know, it's 200 milliseconds. There's no rule on that, but that's what works for me. So basically, when I a real EP would have all these songs chopped up into bits and pieces. But let's say let's pretend for the sake of time that I did all of them. Now I'm making regions for these songs. The reason I make regions is because I need to export a clean wave of each song, right? Um, and just pretend that all the songs are as chopped up as this one was, you know, with yeah. the RX fixes. So a lot of times it's very rare when a song isn't chopped up, but either way I use that script to make a region for each song. And I also have it set up for instrumentals. If I, if I have a main version in the instrumental, it's, I can still copy the song title, press a different key. The region is named after the song. And then it also adds instrumental to the region name, which comes in handy because that's what the files are going to be called. So anyways, let's pretend that I'm happy with, Obviously, how the sounds and everything's declicked and RXed with headphones. I went through all the songs. Now I need to get them into WaveLab, right, to finish it off. Yep. So um, this is going to render pretty quickly because there's no plugins running. It renders at like 140 times, I think, speed. So it's really fast. Awesome. Because all the plugins are off. And basically, what it's doing is it's rendering a clean wave of this song with all the fixes in it. Yeah. So I'm going to press that button. Looks like it's going as expected. Just making a new wave of each song. And again, I have it scripted so it makes it in a specific location. Um, so it made it in my project folder. I have analog captures, 96K. These are all five songs cleaned up, RX, analog chain. Um, basically, it's a, a, a wave file of each region that I just made. Yeah. I don't know why Wave usually WaveLab just opens clean. So then this is where I do kind of the final steps in WaveLab. I this is all templated, but I basically make a new audio montage and grab the files that I need. Awesome. And, and I need to put them in the correct order, but WaveLab has a new feature. So when I rendered it from Reaper, Reaper's gotten better at metadata. So Reaper just dropped a little tag that said, this is song one, two, three, and four. Because as you can see, the songs are just named their exact title. Yeah. I don't put any numer anything different in the names right now. I do when they're delivered, but long story. But I can press this button here, and Reaper's going to sort it. So now this with one button, now the songs are in the correct order again. You know, when I first loaded them in, they were alphabetical. Yeah. Let's see here. So annoying when that happens. Oh, just while you're doing that, someone's just yeah. asked on uh, YouTube, uh, what project management app do you use? Um, it's called OmniFocus. Cool. Um, it's it's kind of like Trello, but it's just for Mac. And I'm kind of a sucker for Mac aesthetics, you know, like, because it has an actual Mac app. Oh, yeah. now, my doc, now my doc is back. Um, so I have... OmniFocus right here, and uh, it's got a lot of projects right now, but it's really cool because, again, there's the iPhone app, there's the Mac app, but what's cool about it is, again, it's a lot like Trello, but when someone submits a new project on my website, a mastering project, yeah, it comes into my email, of course, all the details, but OmniFocus can have a, or does, OmniFocus has a special email address that's not memorizable, but... It also goes into my project management app. So I don't have to manually copy all the project data into OmniFocus. It's already in the OmniFocus inbox. And then I put the songs in the correct order, or not, sorry, put the projects in kind of order of importance and first of yeah. line and stuff like that. 
so yeah, I highly, if you're if you're a Mac user, OmniFocus is great. Um, if you're a PC user or you just don't care about Mac aesthetic Mac aesthetics, I think Trello is a good option. Cool. Um, it's I think that Trello is more web based and yeah. So there's two good options there, but especially for mastering, you know, when I was recording bands, I could put like, oh, on Tuesday I'm going to record this band or Wednesday I'm going to mix this album. But with mastering, it's so fast paced and I just have a basically a first con- uh, a to do list, and I might yeah. get on Thursday. I might be this far, or I might be that. Far. There's no like, it's not really a calendar. It's just kind of like a. And then when projects are done, I can slide them down at the bottom and make them dim, so it means I've sent it out. I'm waiting for approval, um, and even though it comes in as an email, you can type stuff. So if someone says, "Oh, we changed the album name to this thing," you know, you can't really edit an email, but you can edit in OmniFocus, you can say, oh, here's the new album name. Um, so Omni, yeah, so I use OmniFocus. Brilliant. Um, but anyways, back to WaveLab. I just yeah. pressed this button and now their songs are back in the order they were in Reaper. And there's a few ways to work in WaveLab, but um, let me undo that because I want to do it a slightly different way because Wave WaveLab 11 has lanes now. So basically I should have pressed lanes why did it go to tracks? I'm going to try this one more time, and if not, I'll give up. Um, cool, no problems. Lanes. There we go. So this is Sweet. one track, and now we have two different lanes. You used to have to do it on two tracks, which is not a huge deal. But the point is, you know, I'm not using, you know, you see people mastering in, like, Cubase or Pro Tools, and they have 12 tracks stair-stepped, and it's just, I think, really inefficient because... It takes up a lot of space on your screen, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just going to save this quick. And again, this is where I would determine the song order. Obviously, the first song is, I don't have to touch the beginning because I've already addressed it in Reaper. It's got 200 milliseconds of digital silence. Yeah. But I may want to say like, okay, I'm going to listen to this tale and whatever's happening there. Maybe I want a little more breathing room before the second song starts so i listen to that i decide that's great um and then maybe the artist wanted these two songs to overlap so i can overlap them and i can maybe crossfade this down and fade it out a little sooner something like that they want to do a little crossfade so basically listen to the song the heads and tails and you know, sometimes I might have, I might have tapered it in Reaper, but maybe I want to go a little more in WaveLab. But at least I have the option of dragging it back if they decide it was too sharply trimmed. So basically, just sequencing the songs. You know, yeah. Some of the, some of the less exciting tasks of mastering, but I think really important. You know, there's there's a podcast I listened to, and one of the guys was like, "Yeah, you know, the client approved the master, so now I'm making the the sequence in the DDP," and I'm like. What do you mean? Like I do this first because when I deliver a master, I want it to sound like a record. I want it yeah. to, aside from sounding good, the flow between the songs is equally important to me. I want it, when they listen to it for the first time, I want it to sound like it's a finished product. I don't want them yeah. to be like, yeah, it sounded pretty good, but there was like four seconds of silence and uh, we really wanted one sec. You know, I'd just do it all right away. Cause then when they hear version one, if they love it, it it's approved. I have, I still have to make the the parts, the extra files, but I don't have to do any more creative tasks whatsoever. It's done. So I do all this stuff right away. The sequencing is very important to me to get it right from the start. Um, and Because you also want to make sure like your DDP and your WAV files and your vinyl master, you want to make sure those all have the same spacing between the songs. You don't want you, you don't want to be like, oh, now I need to make the vinyl master. Let me do that. And then it has different, you know, whether it's by mistake or happenstance, now the song spacing is different. Like when I, when I get a project approved, I I branch off of this and make the vinyl master and do what I need to do for vinyl, but it doesn't change like the song sequencing and stuff. So, anyways, so once the really? song once the songs are good, then I make markers for each song, and because I named the files so perfectly from the artist's information, you know the markers are named perfectly. I do have to go in and address this crossfaded one you know maybe i'll put the marker crossfades are tricky because it's never going to be the most beautiful transition ever but 
Yeah. You, you got to decide where you want it to. What do you, what do you want it to sound like when it transitions? You know, it'll be gap, it'll be gapless, but you know, you might hear a bit of the sustain of the song. So otherwise the other markers should be perfectly placed because like I said, it's got 200 milliseconds of silence baked in roughly. Those are all good. So this is where I would, uh, then I listen to the songs again. I've usually had a little bit of break from the songs at this point because I had to wait for it to print. So now I have a somewhat fresh perspective again, fresh ears, clean palette. Yep. And then I'll listen again. And um, I usually pretty, pretty quickly, I'll add a limiter. And at this point I've done, I've got the song so refined that in a lot of cases, the same limiter works for all the songs because it's, they're already on the same page. And if anything, I might need to feed a little bit more. If the song felt a little quiet, I could feed a little more into it. Or honestly, I do a lot of automation of levels. Sometimes when people say a song sounds too quiet, they, sometimes they just mean like the front half of it. Yeah. The ending might be totally squashed already, so there's really no room to make it louder. But what they're, but what their thing is maybe a, the front half of it's too dynamic. So, I mean, sometimes this is very crude editing, of course, but I might creep up the beginning a little bit with automation feeding into the limiter. Um, or I might make sometimes things sound too loud you know maybe this is meant to be a gentle intro and again excuse my sloppy editing i'm just trying to go quickly but maybe the beginning of the song is too screaming it needs to be more delicate so i can automate it down yep Makes any sense. number of things so in my in my opinion this is why you need, really why you need some kind of mastering software of clip effects clip automation and then in wave lab of course i inserted a limiter on the montage output, which affects everything equally, you know, no matter what song I play, it's going through that. But if I decide that, you know, song one is a little bass shy, um, I can certainly add a little more low end at this stage because I've captured it at such a reasonable level that it doesn't sound bad to add more low end digitally right here. I don't have to go back to my analog settings if, if I don't want to. Now, if I totally miss the mark, then yeah, I'll probably jump back to the analog world and redo it. But if it's just a little tweak, very easy to do right here in WaveLab. Um, or if it's a little too bright, whatever it needs, I can do right here in WaveLab. And now, again, this is clip effect, so it's only affecting that song. Um, if I go to this song, you can see there's no clip effects inserted yet. So again, I'm just listening. This is because I wasn't really doing a real project. This came in on a little bit on the quiet side, but yeah, it's kind of appropriate. Well, I guess it's not too quiet minus nine LUFS, but you get the idea. I just kind of listen and decide how loud can we push it before it starts to sound bad. And then I usually stop there and sometimes people love it or a lot of times people love it. Sometimes they say, sounds great, but can you make it louder? And then I can try pushing it louder. And sometimes they prefer that. Or sometimes they say, actually, you were right. It was, it was better the first time. That's the thing that mastering engineers have the luxury of is we can stare right at the cliff of where, where does it go south? You know, I can sit here and listen and be like, okay, it sounds fine with two and a half decibels of limit, you know, gain on the limiter, but when I go to three, it sounds too squashed. I have the luxury of hearing that in a nice room, whereas yeah. the client doesn't. They have to like sometimes they have to hear it and be like, oh yeah, it sounds too harsh now. Go back where go back to where you had it. So sometimes we need to step back and think about how we have the luxury of playing with it in a great environment and they don't so they need to maybe hear it to, to know that it, it can't go any louder without getting too squashed or harsh sounding so yeah um i don't want i mean it's up to you but i have plenty of videos i have a website called wavelabhelp.com yeah awesome. um, i have tons of videos on there about rendering files you know how to get the files out of here um out of wave lab because yeah again this is and, and if i was just mastering in the box i would do very similar to what I just showed you, but also a combination of what I did in, in Reaper. You know, if I was, let's say I'm starting, starting a new project right now, forget everything, everything I just did. I could open up the files, put them in the correct order, which I'm just making up right now. Yeah. Load them into wave lab. Now these would have to be trimmed because these are the raw. This is a new project. If you uh, are playing along. So yeah. I could, I could load these into wave lab and then I could also, you know, meta normalize them to get them all on the same page loudness wise. So if I played this back, they would all feel 
pretty close to the same level. Then I could just add clip effects as needed per song and then master output effects. There are track effects too, but, but I don't really use tracks in Reaper. So anyway, uh, WaveLab is just super powerful. You know, the, this is where I also enter in all the, I have a script for entering the CD text really quickly. Yeah. So if you watch what I just am doing here, I just added, and this is a special character I got to clear. I just added CD text for every song in like 10 seconds or less. Yeah. And that, and that means when I render the GDP, of course, the CD text will be there, but also when I render the waves and MP3s, the metadata will be added and it'll all be accurate and it won't be, you know, I don't have to do it separately for each format. It's just, you, you enter the information in one time, whatever you render is, um, the information, you know, the song title is going to be the same in whatever you render. There's no chance for it to get mixed up because of a typo or you forgot or something. It's all, yeah, that's, that's the whole beauty of wave lab is enter the information. Once it goes everywhere, yeah. makes your life so much easier for finishing projects. And again, I could have, I feel like I could have more easily done what I showed you in Reaper and wave lab versus trying to get Reaper to do what I'm showing you right here. Cause it's just not cut out for it. Yeah. Anytime, anytime you have a program that can do like MIDI, virtual instruments, you know, it's just, it's not a specialty program. It's a, it's a Swiss army. Reaper is like a Swiss army knife. Yeah. But it's not a specialty program for mastering. I, I, I do think they could, um, if they spent a little time, they could make it like the definitive mastering program too. But right now it's not that, in my opinion, it's, you'd have to do way too much scripting. I've already done way too much scripting. You'd have to do even more to get it to do what wave lab does for me. So that's why I use two programs. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, I like to just use the best tools for the job and, and that's why I use two programs and I do use RX for sample rate conversion. And again, if you go on my wave lab help website, I, I, that's where I get more into the weeds of wave lab. Um, for anyone that's interested wavelabhelp.com because I don't want to bore brilliant. you guys any more than I already have, but no, I'm not. It's, this is great. This is brilliant. So there's good. a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, st strategy to, you know, getting the files out of here accurately. Like for example, f from this stage, I don't render each song one at a time. I render the whole thing as one file mm -hmm. to bake in the processing because, you know, especially in the case of song overlaps, if I tried to render right now, if I tried to render each song at a time, there's going to be a, a, a disruption here where the songs overlap because of how plugins work. It's not a wave lab problem, but if I render it all in one pass and then I render track by track with no processing, then it will render this transition cleanly. And then when you insert it, it'll have a totally gapless seamless playback for the songs that overlap. So yeah. it's kind of a method to the madness. And then when the project's approved, I can uh, branch off of this and do a vinyl master and I'll do what I need. You know, this is where Reaper falls off the map for being usable, but I can tell it which songs are on side A, which ones are on side B of the vinyl or cassette. I can render a wave of each side, which is what the cutting engineer wants. And then I can make a PDF. Let me see if I have one for a different record. Um, I can make a PDF. I'm trying to see which, what did I finish that has a, a vinyl master recently? This one. So here's like what a folder looks like when I'm all done with a record. You know, I have the 16-bit 44 one waves. I have the 24-bit 44 one waves. I have yeah my original, the, the full resolution 24-bit 96 waves. I have a DDP for CD production. I have MP3s. Um, they didn't send me the artwork for this record, but I could have um, put it in there. And then what I was trying to show you is the vinyl. So my vinyl um, folder has just one wave for each side, side A and B. And then a nice PDF report of what's on the side. And more importantly, side B, as I told you, you know, in the montage, side B starts at whatever time, you know, 18 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. But the cutting engineer doesn't care about that. They Because side B has its own file. So as you can see, the timestamp start, start over at zero. So that's for the, specifically for the vinyl cutting engineer. And there could be a way to script Reaper to spit, spit this out, but it, I just don't think it would... It's not really designed for that. So that's where no. it kind of falls no, off. No. So anyways, I think use the right tool for the job. And then, you know, some people use Pro Tools, whatever, for all of the mastering. And then they use only like, you know, Sonoris or Hofa to finalize. 
and those are fine but i like wave lab is a little more intermediate for me it lets me aside from finalizing it lets me do still some actual like processing work or all of it like i said if i'm in the box yeah you know so anyways for me it's the best tool for the job and it's reasonably priced um and again wave lab 11 is by far the most stable the most responsive zippy fast favorite version to work with so um if you, for those that haven't tried wave lab in at least a few years i mean wave lab 11 is worth looking into i'm not trying to be a salesperson but no um, no not so over over the years i mean um bob weston from chicago mastering he would email me and say you know can wave lab do this particular thing and i have to say no can't sorry but starting with wave lab 10 it, it, he's using it now and um because as crazy as it sounds you couldn't record from one track to another track yeah it's the simplest thing in the world right in any other program to like like i showed you in reaper you know have the source on one track run it through some gear record on another track that was kind of hard to do in wave lab until somewhat recently so again if you haven't tried wave lab in a while it's it's worth looking into it again and yeah so 100%. Enough about wave lab i've talked way too much do you have any questions or man yeah loads. yeah okay. yeah completely um my question to you is as well is that Okay, so someone that wants to try out WaveLab, I know there's a, a light, I don't know what it's called, but there's a, there's a light version, isn't there, of WaveLab, yep, that wave someone lab can elements. also grab? Elements, yeah. So would you say that someone that's um, learning, mastering, you know, from scratch as well, because I'm sure that, you know, students watching this and, you know, people getting into mastering will find this really inspiring, but they might have a limited budget. So would you advise them to try out WaveLab Elements alongside Reaper as well, or just maybe give WaveLab Elements a go? Um, WaveLab Elements, is it's it kind of depends what you're after. If you're after plugins, I mean, some people consider plugins like the mastering software. I, I don't use WaveLab, I don't use any, I don't use WaveLab for the plugins at all. I use it for the workflow and the environment that it provides. Yeah. Um, I use a lot of third-party plugins, to be honest. And it's not that the Steinberg ones are not good. I'm just used to using the other ones. Um, if I had to master a whole record with stock plugins and wave lab, I wouldn't be too afraid to do that. It would, I'd be a little slower cause I would have to figure out what's what, but I could yeah. do it. But the one restriction with wave lab elements is that you can't really do track markers. Um, each track is defined by the length of the file, which is a little bit of a limitation in my opinion. I mean, it looks very similar to this, but there are some limitations. There's less plugin slots. So yeah. I, I would honestly say, wait for it to go on. A, if you're a, if you are on a budget, wait for it to go on sale, and just try to get WaveLab Pro. It's totally worth it. If you're trying Amazing. to do if you're trying to do professional mastering on a daily basis, yeah. Um, and again, not even for the plug, just the overall bigger picture. If anything, you know, buy WaveLab Elements when it's on sale, and then upgrade to Pro when it's on sale again, or something like that. You know, there's yeah. ways to get into it. Um, but I just think it's, you know, here's kind of what happened. I was recording and mixing a lot. I was a Mac user. This is 2008 or nine or so. And yeah. I was using WaveBurner by Apple. Apple used to have a program called WaveBurner and it was part of Logic. So I, I bought Logic, which wasn't cheap back then. Um, it was like 900 bucks. I bought Logic just for this little app called WaveBurner. And it was kind of like WaveLab, but super basic um but back then there wasn't a lot of options for mac users and i but it, it wasn't realistic for me to purchase a pc like a windows pc and figure out windows get it optimized yeah. and then and then spend like you know two grand on sequoia i mean that would have been a huge investment for me that's back then that wasn't really feasible for someone that was just getting into mastering so um even though WaveLab, I forget the price of WaveLab Pro, but when you consider that it's already, you know, most people are using Mac, I think, in in the audio world. When you consider that you don't have, you can use it on your existing Mac, and it, you know, it's a pretty good value because 10, 15 years ago, most people had to get a PC just for mastering because Sequoia and Pure Mix, you know, they're only Windows only. So I mean, it's just the way it is. I don't know why. Yeah. Up until recently. The mastering world was heavily pc based and you know now we have studio one which kind of has a little mastering mode built in we have hofa yeah um but now there's more mac options but i still you know 
think wave lab so wave lab came at a great time for me because i i, I didn't want to get a whole different computer i want to stay on mac and even though wave lab 7 was a little tough to get my head around when it first came out that was the first mac version you know it's come a long way and it's i'd say just wait for pro to go on sale if, if you're on a budget or, or find a way to get pro to work but certainly elements will help you get familiar with the architecture of wave yeah. lab and there's yeah, some absolutely. weird just some weird limitations like i said with you know i can decide that you know maybe actually what's a better i can decide that um they want a long space between these two songs yeah well when i render these by track you know it's going to include everything after that clip up to that marker as part of the track but in yeah. elements in elements the track is determined by the file link so you'd have to like add a bunch of silence to this file it's just yeah it's just a little a little more limited but yeah no, that, that good, makes starting sense. Point. good starting absolutely point. Thanks for that, man. Um, Math Matthias um, on, uh, so, sorry for mispronounce your name. Um, so Math Matthias has actually said on um, on YouTube, says if you're a student, you can also buy the educational version of Wave Lab as well, which is nearly half the price. So that would be a great way, I suppose, for students as well that obviously are on a budget to get the educational version of Wave Lab as well. Yeah, and yeah, and, and that's the full version. I used to teach at a technical college, the mastering course, and I was able to get the school to purchase enough wave lab licenses for the whole i forget what it was like 15 17 computers yeah, yeah and brilliant. that's yeah that's the full version so if you are a student or an instructor or yeah. somehow can get a student discount i mean that's that's a good avenue too it's yeah like i said it, it may seem like a lot but not too long ago it was it's a it would have been considered not a lot so i mean we've yeah. come a long way with software absolutely uh, and prices so Absolutely. Yeah, definitely go for the pro version then, as Matthias has just said. Um, amazing, man. Um, yeah, so um, before we go there, I've got a couple of questions to to fire at you as well. Um, should we take off the your screen? Take off the... Yeah, I'm sure I'll think of something I forgot, but if anyone has any questions, they can email me or go... And on, on the topic of WaveLab, there's also a WaveLab users Facebook group where people get to ask a lot of questions about wave lab i can help you there too that's a good place to go um, yeah i think we can get i'm sure i forgot something but let's just take it off and um we'll, yeah we'll, thanks that's, man. that's the way it is that's so cool actually i was on the wave lab group and i remember reaching out to you i think it was a couple of years ago when i was like digging into wave lab as well um and you were great you were really gracious and you asked to answer some questions for me directly on facebook so i'm really thankful for that man it's um absolutely brilliant it's so good. Uh, my question to you, though, is like, um, as far as, you know, as I know it's a big topic at the minute and, you know, loads of mastering engineers have got their own version of this. And I'm sure you have clients going about, you know, the loudness wars and also, you know, kind of streaming services with LUFS. So for mastering engineers kind of just getting bombarded with so much information at the minute, where would you go with LUFS? Would you go, right, this needs to be, you know, spec on what spotify want or would you go no actually i'm going to push a little further and take it to minus 10. obviously i know it's you know depends on the style of music as well but you know where would you go with it and what would you say back to a client that's worried about that they want it to be bang on minus 14. yeah well it does depend on the style of music and what the client wants but no matter what that is i would never do to master to the levels that spotify talks about it's just kind of a myth in my opinion you hear about this so much online you should should you master to minus 14. yeah and there's a couple of reasons why that's a bad idea one is spotify has and can change that level at any point in time you know there was a point in time when they were using minus 12. spotify even has three settings within the app if you look in the settings so they have a, like a i forget what they call it quiet medium and loud yeah so Spotify is complicated within itself. And like I said, they could change at any point in time. But another reason, which isn't the only other reason, but, um, you know, Apple Music is not normalized by default. So when people start asking me about levels, when especially clients, I usually have to start by asking, you know, which streaming service do you usually use for you know, casual listening? If they're Spotify listeners, then I explain it one way. If they're Apple Music, I explain it the other way because let's say you go buy let's say you buy a new iphone tomorrow yeah and you get it set up and you decide to use apple music apple music does not have normalization on by default at this time um, so that means whatever the level it was mastered at it's going to play at that level 
Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a setting called sound check that you can turn on that um sets the songs to roughly the same level, but Apple's level is lower than Spotify, which doesn't really matter. The only thing that really matters is within the app itself. So let's say you did master something to minus fourteen. If you listen to it on Apple Music, you're probably gonna be disappointed that it's quieter and wimpier than um most other modern pop rock productions within the last 15, 20 years, because most people don't adhere to that. Now, if you're a Spotify okay. user, if you install the Spotify desktop or mobile app today or tomorrow, normalization is on by default, which means it's setting all the songs to roughly the same level by default. So yeah. that, that's two hugely different experiences right there. And that's just the luck of the draw. That's like, oh, I, I, I would rather use Apple Music or I would rather use Spotify. Basically, all of them are on by default, except Apple. Tidal has it on by default. Um, Amazon has it on by default. I don't know about Deezer, and I know that Kobuz, which is my favorite streaming service, Q-O-B-U-Z, yeah. ha- does not have it on by default. But the, the main consumer ones do, except Apple Music. Now, um, I did catch wind that Apple, at some point in the somewhat near future, is going to have normalization on by default but they're not going to go into your phone and turn it on. It's just for new devices. So yeah, it won't be until you get a new Mac or iPhone or iPad that it'll be turned on by default. So yeah. it's going to be a while before everyone using Apple is normalized by default. It's going to take a long time because some people don't upgrade their devices very quickly. But my, my main theory there is just I master it as loud as it needs to be in digital full scale to sound good. I don't really care about streaming what happens on streaming. I just worry, I just care about how good does it sound? Cause if you make a master that sounds good in digital full scale, yeah. it's going to sound good everywhere. Now there are times when clients ask me about Spotify in particular, and they want to make sure it's loud and I'll do a master that's say minus nine LUFS integrated. And if they say it sounds great, but can it be louder? And I really care that it's loud on Spotify. That's when I say I can go louder, but Spotify is already turning it down four or five decibels, whatever the thing you know says. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If I go louder, it's just going to get turned down more. So you're fighting yourself. So if you want to fight yourself, I will gladly make it louder. But if your goal is to sound louder through Spotify's normalization, going louder is just going to make it sound smaller because now we're chopping off the transients and the punch is gone. We're making it smaller so that when it gets turned down, it's just going to get kind of dwarfed and small sounding. So yeah, I do, you know, I definitely don't master to a certain level, but I do use the intelligence that we have to say, again, if you're, if you're only, and I think Spotify is probably the most popular streaming service. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. if it's a if, if it's a client that says I really only care about how it sounds on Spotify, I'll say okay. Well, here's why you may want to care about Apple Music, although this is changing because of what I just said, where they're gonna have normalization on. But if they're just honed in on and obsessed about Spotify, that's when I will start to break out some of these numbers and say, you know, we can go louder, but it's gonna get turned down. But I always have to say in most because if you use the web browser of Spotify, which I never do. That's not normalized. Um, if you have a smart TV with the Spotify app in it, those tend to not be normalized. So there's you can't make a blanket statement about any of this stuff. It's all a big mess, which is why I default to. I just make it as loud as it needs to be to sound good in full scale. Whatever happens in the real world is going to happen. You know, uh, there's no standard. I, sometimes people ask me to master stuff um, to industry standard, which drives me nuts. Cause there is no industry standard or, <laughs> or radio ready, which is not a thing. No. In fact, radio ready is almost kind of like Spotify and that a lot of FM stations apply more processing. So the mixes that are less squashed tend to fare better on some of the more hyped up FM stations. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're talking about your local college radio station that does like no processing and you're lucky if they even have the left and right balance correct on their um, feed. Yeah, maybe, you know, they don't do as much processing. But if you're talking about like any kind of modern station with di- modern digital processing, um, honestly, a less 
a less squash mix is probably going to fare better over the after it travels through their processing yeah. than, than something that's brick walled. So mastering for radio isn't really even a thing either because it depends, excuse me, it depends which station. You know, are you talking about a low budget station? You're talking about yeah, a... completely. So, a- anyways, I'm getting a little off track, but basically, I just use my instinct to what what it needs to be for the genre, and for the client's vision. I mean, one person I can master something. One client thinks it's too loud. One client thinks it's too quiet. Mm. The same, you know, it's it's a matter of taste too. It's a little bit like spicy food, really. You know, yeah, absolutely. What's, what's your taste? You know, <laughs> and some people really obsess about being as loud as x y or z song and Mm. some people just aren't and you know i'm seeing a little bit of a trend of people caring less about squeezing squeezing every last fraction of a decibel knowing that in a lot of cases it will be turned down streaming but again i don't like i don't really pay attention to exactly what spotify is doing when i'm mastering it's not it doesn't really come up in my mind at all until someone asks me and I'll tell them why they shouldn't particularly obsess over just Spotify, but if they still are. And if, I also had a case where a client self mixed and master, or I think their mix engineer mastered it or something. Yeah. And they did, they put it on Spotify and they reached out to me because they were unhappy with how it sounded on Spotify. No way. And if I could master it, I said, well, I, yeah, but look, I said, can you send me your, the master you put on Spotify? Because I want to see what's going on here and why you're unhappy with it. And it was extremely loud, extremely bass heavy. So, you know, the bass is stealing up the headroom. That's super, I can see why they didn't like it on Spotify. So we did, a, I did a master that was, you know, a little more reasonable and level. I, I managed the bass a little better and they were much more happy with it on Spotify. So, I mean, yeah, it's kind of a mess. So basically don't worry about if, if we're talking about music here, you know, just, do what sounds best in full scale and if it sounds good in full scale it's going to sound good everywhere and you know just i think life's too short to obsess about it too much Um, and honestly stuff that's you know you could have a record that's or let's just break it down you could have a song that is minus eight lufs integrated and a song that's minus 11 lufs integrated um the minus 11 song can sometimes appear louder just because of if it's a better mix with, uh, you know, certain, you know, mids, mids and highs tend to um, appear louder than lows. So, I mean, you can't always just go by the numbers either because it depends on how the performance and the mix and all, there's a lot of other factors besides just the number. And I know Bob Katz has talked about this, but mixes tend to have like a loudness potential, you know, people think of mastering engineers as the gatekeeper of the loudness, but, you know, I can make a, I can master a record to minus seven LUFS integrated, but if it's like poorly recorded and performed and like muffly and a lot of low frequencies, it might not sound as loud as a different production that's only minus nine or ten LUFS. That sometimes that stuff can appear louder to our ears. So numbers aren't everything. I mean, they're they're good to like inf- kind of confirm what you're hearing, but they're not everything. So. Absolutely, anyway, man. It's Com- enough LUFS agree. talk, I think. But <laughs> yeah, well, that just really quick. I remember Tim Palmer saying uh, when I interviewed him a couple of months ago. He says, you know, literally, he says, you know, stop reading your meters sometimes and just use your ears as well. I don't know if you agree with that comment, but it's like huh. kind of to a certain degree. But I definitely do, and that's part of why I have such a fixed gain staging thing here in my mastering studio. Is like I could probably get rid of all my meters at this point and just do it all by ear i mean the meters help me work a little faster and and confirm certain things but especially with the the scripting and gain staging i have here i mean i could do it without any meters at all at this point if i had to it's because you know when you're listening in your car you don't have meters although i've always wondered if i could install like some doro meters in my dashboard yeah. so that I could see how loud things are when I'm listening to them in the car, which would be ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, when people are listening in the real world, there's no meters. They're just listening with their ears. And uh, Yeah, absolutely, man. Also, uh, another couple of quick questions before you go, mate, if that's good sure. with you. Yeah, I got, uh, all, I got all night if you need it. Oh, sweet. Nice. <laughs> so many questions for it, though, mate. Um, yeah, so another one would be as well, like kind of when you've got a um, – mix that comes through and the mix engineer says to you i'm sure you've had this loads of times but 
how much room do you need for mastering? You know, I'm sure you get this from quite a few people saying kind of like, do you want it like minus six or minus three, whatever. What's usually your response back to a mix engineer if they ask that question? Yeah, I have gotten that question so often that I wrote an article about it. Yeah. Um, if you go on the Pro Audio Files website, it's called the minus six dB headroom myth. Yeah. And it's because there really is no magic number. It's whatever... Um, it's whatever the mix is, to be honest. The only thing that paints a mastering engineer in the corner is usually peak limiting or clipping. And that's not always a deal breaker. But to me, it doesn't matter if the peak is at minus 10 or minus 6 or minus 1 or minus 0 0.1. Um, those are all the same, in my opinion. Um, yeah. The Like I said, what paints you in a corner is anything with a ceiling, like a limiter, a clipper clipping the output of your DAW, that's where my hands start to get tied. And it's not like I won't master it, but it's like, okay, now I can only do so much. And if you are mild, moderately to heavily limiting the mix already before I get it, and this is not a pun, but it kind of limits what I can do. And it's also not very vinyl friendly. So if, if you're going to be pressing vinyl and you care a lot about how the vinyl sounds, I'm not saying you can't press it to vinyl, but it's typically not very vinyl friendly to have peak limiting anywhere in the chain mastering or mixing. So yeah, um, my general statement is, you know, send me a mix that um, doesn't have any limiting and is that 32 bit float? Because if um, let's say you remove your limiter for, for mastering, if there are any stray peaks that hit zero, the 32 bit float file is going to preserve that. Yeah. Now I'm speaking about in the box mixes. And if you go to that article, there's a little GIF that demonstrates what it looks like when you have a file that looks insanely loud and clipped, but it was saved at 32 bit float instead of 24 bit. Yeah. Um, you can see that with the 24 bit one, obviously you turn it down and it looks like a square wave still. It's just smaller. With the 32 bit float version, all the peaks that were would have been clipped off are still there. So now it looks like a normal waveform. Um, so that's kind of my main rule of thumb there is, you know, save the mix at 32 bit float, the same sample rate as the mixing session and without any peak limiting or anything with the ceiling. Even if what doesn't work is putting the limiter like um, to zero where it's not doing anything because yeah. the peaks could still be slamming into the ceiling. You got to actually remove it. But I, I also don't, I don't also demand that people remove their limiting because sometimes the limiting is part of the mix. So it's kind of a delicate situation. A lot of times I'll say, send both, you know, if, if you've been mixing into a limiter and that's what makes the balance be what it, the client approved, then I need to hear that. I need to know what they signed off on. Yeah. And then most, but not all the time, it still works for me to better for me to start from the unlimited version and get back to where they had it after I kind of do any corrections and colorations that I want to do that I think sound good, I'll, I'll get back to that point, but it helps me to hear the limited version. And then there's sometimes where either all we have is the limited version. The mix engineer is not willing to send another one or, yeah. physically, or physically able or logistically able. Yeah. And I have to start from the limited version and that's sometimes unfortunate, sometimes not a big deal. It's just, totally depends but i would say don't stress out about where your peaks are and it doesn't have to be minus six that's why i put that as the title of the article because i've seen some people stress out over that some mix engineers and like i said if there's no limit if and i'm speaking about it in the box mix if it's yeah yeah, yeah. if it peaks at minus 12 sorry minus 20 minus 12 minus 3 minus 1 it's all the same what really matters is is there any any dynamics left um is there any clipping or limiting going on and I, th I think the minus th six thing came along because of when we used to have to record our mixes back to a DAT machine. You know, those sounded terrible somewhat in general, but also if you got too, if the peaks got too high in a DAT machine, that, that can sound mm -hmm. kind of spl splattery and sizzly. So yeah. I think just, and this is, you know, before instant emails, I think mastering engineers just got this reputation for saying peaks at minus six which is kind of a dumb thing but i get i get why they said it but it doesn't really translate to today's world no um at all i mean there's no harm in it but 
you also don't need to stress out over it, you know? Yeah. Um, whenever, you're in, whenever you're in doubt, you know, send a version that you think is good to go. And if you think, if you're doing some limiting and you think it's going to be um, too much painting into a corner, then yeah, just remove the limiting, send both versions, explain what, what you're sending. And I would say most of the times I at least try to start with the non-limited version and that opens up the door again for making good vinyl master, usually for doing good processing in general. And, but we always need that. It's, it's sort of a, what's the right word? It's sort of a, setting up someone to fail if you've mixed into some crazy limiting and ozone processing and then you remove that without even telling the mastering engineer that's sort of setting them up to fail it's kind of a trap because it's happened to me where somebody mixed into some really aggressive limiting whatever i don't even know and i have no knowledge of this all i have is the unmastered version without any of that and sometimes it's fine. I'm sure it's happened and I didn't know it and everything worked fine, but I've run into cases where I mastered and like, oh, wow, the, the sounds way different than what the mixing person was doing. What's up with that? And I'll say, well, what, what were they sending you? And then I'll get the MP3 of the reference and it's just this insanely blown out, ridiculous thing. And I'm like, oh, I had no idea that existed or that's what you liked i mean i can do that i just needed to know so if you're a mix engineer if, if you're removing that stuff it's really appreciated to include a reference version with all that processing so we as the mastering engineer know what was approved maybe what to a ballpark to aim for and yeah otherwise, otherwise we're starting from an unfair starting point in my opinion or at least the un unknown starting point or you're, you're kind of a yeah it's, it's i think you get what i'm saying I do, man. That's so good. Thanks so much there, Justin. Um, I know it's a bit of an elephant in the room, maybe, but uh, Dolby Atmos, I know we had a brief chat about this before we went live on the stream, but um, I know that, you know, there's so many debates Some people, I know people have been having arguments online about this, which is bonkers, because at the end of the day, we're all here to support one another and try new things out. And I know some artists have been getting excited over Dolby Atmos and other artists have been there saying, oh, no, actually, I just want to stay in stereo and that's it. But what are your thoughts? Do you reckon that consumers will take it on? Do you reckon it is a, a great thing to learn for us engineers as well, do you? I've been trying to be very open-minded about Atmos. And when I get free time, I will put my Apple AirPod, whatever pros in or the Macs. Yeah. I have both. Yeah, I'll try to listen to the Apple spatial playlists. And it ranges from not bad to interesting to really weird. And I've just not heard anything in Atmos musically that has compelled me to listen to it another time. Yeah. Like I've heard a couple good sounding things. I've listened to some classic records, which I think that that's going to tie into my next comment, but I'm not sold on it for music. I think it's obviously useful for gaming, for video, film, TV. I think it's also valid for some types of music, ambient, maybe some classical music that was produced written and recorded with the intent of being immersive i think could be cool i've mastered a few things f for binaural yeah uh, even before atmos was even a, a, a on people's conscience um and i know that people are releasing atmos music but from what i see it's people that obviously they're remixing a lot of back catalog stuff of classic albums big artists yeah. and that's where a lot of engineers are probably financing their atmos rigs from because they got contracts to mix the entire yeah. whatever legacy artist back catalog in atmos and here's a big check and go buy a bunch of speakers and do that a few times and yeah you can justify an atmos rig for that and also you know there are some newer artists obviously the big artists and even some of the mid-level artists some of them are i've seen some atmos releases come through the pipeline for some I would say mid-level artists, you know, not household names, but not your indie band down the street. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, cause they have a little bit of a record label budget to just to experiment with it and say, Hey, we have it for those who want it because everyone's doing it at this point in time. I don't see it taking off for the majority of music that's being released. And when I say majority, you have to think of like, like I said, the indie band that is going to sell a hundred CDs, and you know maybe get a, some you know smaller bands you know with maybe like 
300 to 500 Instagram followers. I hate to use that as a benchmark, but you know what I mean? You know, not. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's bands similar. that are That's... bands that are popular in their music scene or area, yeah, but yeah. not huge. Um, yeah. So when you think about all the music being created and a lot of the records I master are indie, pro you know, I don't do a lot of major label stuff. It's a lot of independent bands. Um, some you've heard of, some you haven't. But that's kind of my bread and butter. And I've had literally, I think one person asked me if I did Atmos and that was almost out of curiosity and um, not expecting it. And I just don't see it taking off for a lot of music. I, I mean, maybe I'll be wrong and I'll be, um, maybe I will be, you know, driving for Uber in 10 years because I didn't get an Atmos rig or something. But I, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't, at this point in time, what is it? October 28th, yeah. 2021. Again, maybe I'll be used in some kind of ridiculous montage to, to show <laughs> to show how wrong I was, but I don't see it taking <laughs> off for popular everyday music. Again, yeah. I think I think if there's an intent to it being immersive, that's cool. That's an experience, but I don't need to hear, you know, I listened to um, Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses and Atmos and it was a thing that happened. I don't want to hear it in Atmos again because it was weird. Um, yeah, I've, I've listened to some stuff that sounds fine. I mean, to me, it still just sounds kind of phasey and weird. It sounds like when I get off the airplane and my ears haven't fully popped or something. It's just like everything is. <laughs> it just doesn't feel right. But I could see. Yeah, fair enough. I could see playing a video game and that being cool. I could see watching yeah, a TV yeah, show so. and that being. But yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't, I'm still not feeling it for everyday music. I know that's a long answer, but and maybe I'll be wrong and maybe people will get better at mixing an Atmos and it will sound better. But for, for right now, I've just, again, I tried to listen to those Apple playlists and be open-minded, but yeah. it's, not, it's not grabbing me as something that, and I'm like an audio person. So now I'm thinking of like, what is the person down the street? Do they, have they even heard of Atmos? I, I don't know. Like, I think it's, you know, then maybe I'll be wrong, but I, I remember when 5.1 was a thing and I was too early in my career to even consider a 5.1 rig. Yeah. I didn't even have a studio to put one in. I was freelancing, but, you know, I remember when that was going to be the big thing. And then I think kind of what killed that was the iPod came out. Yeah. People have two ears. They don't sit in a room and listen to music anymore. So that kind of killed 5.1 for, again, people are making 5.1 music releases, classical you know, you can get Beck C change in 5.1. You can get some classic records in 5.1. Yeah. But that's a niche thing. That's not everyday listening. And again, I just, I'm keeping my eyes and ears open in case I need to. And as we talked about, you know, this winter, I'll probably at least figure out the logistics of the software side of it via yeah. headphone, via headphones. Cause you can, you can still do a lot. And again, I know that there's a lot of people that are busy with Atmos work, but I think it's a lot of back catalog and certain artists. And I, and I, I think uh, it's hard to say if that'll dry up or if that'll just be everyone's expecting Atmos and I'll have to scramble and figure that out. But at this point in time, I'm not too worried about it. In fact, um, you know, my project list is bigger. This is my best year. I know Atmos just came out this year, but obviously my busiest and best year in the studio and my, list of mastering projects I need to get done is huger than ever. And none of them have said the word Atmos to me. So we'll see where, we'll see where it goes, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not, you know, calling up PMC and seeing how long the wait time is for a bunch of speakers <laughs> right now. First, oh, I'm going to just wait it out. I'm going to wait it out, figure out the software side of it. Cause yeah. honestly the speakers seem, you know, there is an art obviously to setting up the speakers, but that can yeah. be done. But I think the biggest challenge in my mind is going to be figuring out, the software side of it that still is yeah. confusing to me so i'm gonna experiment with that in new window or if, if wave lab gets atmos and then just be ready for it if it needs to happen it'll happen if it yeah. goes away then it goes away so absolutely man and i'm you know i said this to you uh, before we went live but i absolutely i'm a new user. user absolutely love new window it's so so good um yeah thanks for that though man really appreciate that so uh a couple of last bits for you then so um i know that again people might sometimes struggle to obviously be in a, a room like yours which is amazing and it's obviously you've got all the acoustics up and you're all good to go and it's everything is carefully measured and your ears are used to that room now uh, but then people are obviously going to be there thinking oh well how the hell else you know am i meant to do this with 
a small, maybe a spare bedroom or something like that, maybe if they're just starting out or learning audio. Um, and I know people are starting to use headphones in audio with like great DACs and great headphones um, as well. You know, people like Glenn Schick, you know, it's like kind of leading the way with that. Uh, but I know people are very opinionated still about headphones as well. So just wonder what your thoughts are really, to be fair. You know, can you achieve maybe not amazing masters, but can you achieve good masters in the headphones if that's your only source or can it be done, done do you feel? I think it can definitely be done with good headphones. And my opinion really changed on that this year because I was forced to use headphones for a little while. I moved my studio. Yeah. Um, first we moved to a new city. So my studio was like our, a little over hour drive away, which is a logistical problem. So I had my home set up and I was forced to use headphones for a little bit more than I would normally feel comfortable. And I couldn't believe the results. You know, I, I was comfortable doing it. Clients were approving it on version one. Everyone is happy. Everyone's loving it. And that honestly affected the build out of my new room and how far I needed to take it because yeah. I got really comfortable with the Odyssey um, headphones. I think they're totally, I mean, I think the key is not the brand. Obviously, Odyssey makes great headphones, but yep, just the, the open back nature of, headphones i think is important for if you're going to mix or master with them i mean i'm just wearing these cheap sony's so they don't um, bleed into the mic here but um when i'm working i have the odyssey headphones and they just sound amazing and i am extremely comfort i got extremely comfortable this winter and spring working on them to the point where even in this room i use them more than i would have two years ago for and i used to just use headphones for quality control checking for clicks and pops yeah. But with the DAC and the headphone amp that I have and the headphones themselves, I mean, I would not be afraid. In fact, um, I'm experimenting with a mobile rig um, f with just headphones, you know, and I, I have had to master stuff. A few years ago, we went to Hawaii and, of course, somebody has an urgent mastering project. Yeah. And I did have my Odyssey headphones and my little Grace m900 and my laptop and i did it and they approved it on version one and i don't feel guilty admitting there that because they're they're hiring me to do my job they're not hiring me to use this piece of gear or you know if they're happy i'm happy if i'm happy they're happy so um yeah i have i have done it on you know when i'm on trips whether it's vacation or going to nam or aes show um it's just how the world works today i mean you can release music so fast now it's like i had to do it then and there um it's just a little ep but they approved it version one and um so yeah I, I think headphones are totally viable and somebody posted the other day on facebook or i think they just changed the name to meta which as we were going live which is kind of meta in itself i don't know if you heard the news but facebook has a new name it's called meta um, no some, really all right yeah, okay no, i've not heard that somebody <laughs> Somebody posted on Meta, formerly known as Facebook, um, that they just moved to a new space and they showed a picture, like you just said, a small bedroom. Yeah. Probably it looked like they would have had roommates. So like making a lot of noise is probably not going to fly most of the time, or at least. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I didn't want to reply. I, I've gotten better about getting in Facebook discussions because it's kind of a waste of time, um, especially politics and all that stuff. But one million percent. Yeah. What went through my head was. Uh, don't even worry about acoustic treatment. Get a good DAC, get the best Odyssey headphones you can afford. And that's probably going to be about the same as what you're going to spend on acoustic treatment anyways. And just forget about the room. If, if the room is a big compromise, just I think at this point, throw it out and just do headphones. Um, and, you know, I, I have a little, I didn't show it on the tour, but I have a little speaker here called... Uh, the IK multimedia micro something or other. I'm sure people know what I'm talking about. It's yep. a little IK speaker. And I can imagine that that could still sound good in a crappy room because it's not very big. It's not moving a lot of air, but it can still give you that speaker perspective that you, even a great headphone isn't going to give you. Yeah. You know, even the new LCD yeah, yeah. 5 from Odyssey, I've heard it's amazing there's still something about a speaker moving air that's going to give you a different perspective. I think 
yeah what i would do if, if i had to move into a tiny bedroom get you know the best dac you know the rme the one we talked about is a great headphone amp slash dac i like the grace just because for actual traveling it's really tiny and it's bus powered so i mean you can bust it out in a hotel room and doesn't need additional power but if i was going to be mobile permanently you know the rme is a good option some odyssey headphones and you're going to have the best monitor it's kind of like wearing a world-class studio on your head really is a control room on your head in my opinion yeah i'd much rather be doing that than trying to make a a bad room sound reasonable um especially if you're renting um oh yeah you know, tear it all down. so yeah. yeah i think i think headphones are totally viable i have no problem shame in fact you know i could see a point in my career where i'm kind of like glenn and traveling the world or traveling to the artist studio and mastering right there our headphones because for better or worse i mean the headphones they're going to be what they are you know uh, every room sounds different rooms can sound different with different uh humidity levels and times of the day and air you know all that stuff or you know speakers can get bumped speakers can you know headphones can go bad too but speak drivers can wear i don't know i have no i think headphones are totally viable i would totally welcome you know yeah in fact, you know if yeah, if yeah this, when the speakers i have if they ever die or get worn out i mean that might even influence what i replace them with do i replace them with expensive speakers again or do i replace them with just something to get a different perspective and rely lean more on the headphones themselves i mean i think it's totally viable so awesome man that's so th such a great answer thanks for that mate um so i think as well though to be fair as well obviously there's loads of um software you know plugins out there as well that kind of emulate rooms as well so if you're gonna um in a situation like you were you know as you said a few months ago would you solely rely on the headphones and the DAC and the door that you're using or would you be using some sort of headphone software as well? Or would you steer away from that because it's trying to emulate something that's not actually happening? Yeah, I think for mastering, I would not. And I, and I don't, I don't use the, any of the software correction for headphones because for mastering it, it's annoying because I have some hardware meters. So in order for like, you know, sonar works is kind of the basic one in order for sonar yeah. works to work, it has to lower the level so it can do the correction curve so it's not clipping so then that just throws off all your metering for mastering um depending on where you insert it and like i said wave lab has the playback processing which is a perfect place to insert sonar works because there's no danger of you rendering through the the headphone correction eq which i know can happen in pro tools yeah you know if you have the sonar works thing on your master fader which is the only place you can put it then you bounce it through the sonar works. That's going to sound weird if you forget to disable it. Anyways, Reaper and WaveLab have that processing slot, so it's just always there. It's not specific to one session, and then there's no chance of rendering through it. But for mastering, I just I think those kind of things add more issues than they solve for the most yeah. part. This is generally speaking. Yeah, they, yeah, they can sure. they can improve some things, but I think generally speaking, they add more issues than they solve. And I prefer to just keep it natural and get used to any deficiencies of the headphones, which with Odyssey is pretty minimal. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I know we keep saying Odyssey, but, you know, Sennheiser makes the HD 600 and 650s. Yeah, um, awesome headphones And as honestly, well. I have the, in that price range, I have the LCD one from Odyssey. They're a little smaller. Yeah. Those things are incredible sounding for the for that price range. You know, they're under $500, which... To some people it's a lot for headphones for mastering it's not a ton i mean it's you know it's not a you could spend a lot more is what i'm trying to say in the mastering world but yeah. i think those are a great starting point too so i mean um i just prefer to keep i just prefer to get used to how they sound and keep it all natural because then you're not inducing any problems and you're not having level changes to make headroom for the eq curve and now if you're mixing maybe that's a different answer because your level doesn't necessarily matter mixing as much as we talked about and yeah unless you're doing the mastering too and maybe you want to get some more speaker perspective but i think by the time it hits the mastering stage you know i'm not playing with panning typically not playing with stereo imaging and mastering um so i prefer to just keep it natural 
that's awesome man such a good answer thanks for that justin um no yeah just, thanks man uh, just had um music to motion from uh youtube just put on our youtube channel said put sonoworks on listen bus in studio one that eliminates the issue so what are your thoughts on sonoworks either in the room or on headphones do you use sonoworks at all or i don't use it i think it's probably f could help be helpful for some mix engineers again i i tried it about five or six years ago or whenever it started to come out and be more common and to my ears it added more phasey weirdness than it solved Perfect. and i did i did use it as a tool as a basic tool to understand my room at the time i i actually did it in my old house in the basement you know it wasn't my actual studio it was my home yeah. setup i didn't really feel the need for it in my main studio but i mean you know that's my opinion if if, if you like the results you're getting with sonar works as you're working and if your mixes are translating better by using it then then use it i i just i think i'm thankfully i'm at a point where i i'm not i don't need it to solve any problems for me because i have a good room i have good headphones a good headphone amp a good dac you know there's really no problems in my way but yeah if you're yeah. using uh if you're using these sony's for example that i'm wearing right now um maybe maybe it makes them sound a little better i don't know i've never tried it or yeah you know, if, you're, if you're mixing in a closet and small speaker you know there i'm not saying you shouldn't use it but i just haven't had a personal need for it so i can't speak much about it but i think it could be a good if anything a good tool for understanding what your room is doing and then decide when to use it decide when not to do it but the initial my initial takeaway was this is adding more weirdness than it's solving yeah and maybe i just yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. maybe it's gotten better maybe i didn't understand it 100 percent, but that's just my experience with it makes sense man uh last question i've got for you uh from myself um with um apple digital masters so it's always one that i get asked i'm never sure quite how to answer this you know in our community on produce mix fix and conquer or any other community for that matter but um how you know with apple digital masters how do people get certified how does it work in that particular field um it works by emailing i, I can't give out the email address um no. live but there is an email address that you have to con a person you have to contact yeah and i've heard different stories but when i did it you know years ago now I basically had to explain to the person that I understood the concept of it. I had to share a few screenshots of me using, I chose to use um, Sonic's Pro Codec software. Yeah. Apple makes some free tools, um, but I found them to be actually kind of too basic for me. Um, I, I really like the Sonic's Pro Codec app. I showed him that I knew how to use it where I was um, taking a master I did and then checking for clipping after any encoding. Yeah. And, and the thing that people don't think about it, I'm, let me, I'll answer the question first, but basically you have to cool. email Apple and say, obviously I'm a mastering engineer. I know what I'm doing. I understand the concept of Apple digital masters at the time it was called mastered for iTunes, but yeah, understand the concept of leaving enough headroom so that it's not going to clip when it runs through Apple's encoder, which at the time was 256 kilobytes AAC. Um, and that you're supplying the best resolution file that you can, you know, 24 bit and whatever the native sample rate is, um, which all, all it needs to be is 24 bit, 44 one. That's that qualifies as Apple digital masters. You can do higher sample rates, but the minimum would be 24 bit. And this is back in the time when most distributors were only accepting 16 bit, 44 one. It's getting a little bit convoluted now that, you know, all of them except CD baby will accept, higher resolution files so um if you submit um 24 bit 48k or 96 to distro kid yeah and you leave enough headroom even if you're not on apple's list it technically is the, it's it still is master apple digital masters it's just yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah maybe you won't get the badge and then once you do get approved um, whoever's submitting the release has to provide your email address and yeah. again, I don't release my own music, so I've never done this, but I've had people ask me whether it's a band or a record label, you know, are you Apple digital master certified and which email address did you use to, um, to do that? And then they'll just, yeah. and I just, you know, I just did this, uh, this band beach bunny. Yeah. Um, just had a single come out yesterday and I looked on Apple 
music and it has the Apple Digital Masters logo, but and it also has the high res master, whatever. So again, it's getting kind of I don't want to say redundant, but it's kind of strange now that most distributors accept high res anyways, because there was a time when yeah. you had to submit a different file for app mastered for iTunes or Apple Digital Masters, but now it can essentially be one file for everywhere. You know, if if you I could I could send you know my clients could upload a 24 bit 96 k wave to DistroKid, and yeah. that works for everything now. When before it had to be 16 bit 44 one for everything, and then for Apple you could submit the higher res version. And the secret to that is Apple not, Apple never checked for clipping. They just wanted to make sure that you knew how to. They were kind of trusting that you would do it correctly, but they never policed it. They never said. Oh, this file actually clips. So it's it was, I don't want to say it's pointless, but it was, it was kind of a weird thing. But it was their way of yeah. having some kind of standardization. But basically, um, yeah, you have to know who to email at Apple. There's been a lot of message boards, threads about it. If someone wants to know, they could email me, and I yeah. and if I feel like there are, you know, uh, I don't want to say legitimate, but if they understand what they're doing, you know. Yeah. I just, I, yeah, I, yeah. I just can't say the address on the air because that would be. That's fine. Yeah. It would get on. flooded with messages, perhaps. But yeah, <laughs> yeah it's basically just, there's no uh, <laughs> there's no formal like web page where you it's you just kind of kind of got to know and who, know who to email and ex, explain what what the actual process is. It was fairly simple, but. Uh, that makes sense, man. Thanks so much for that. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, Justin, it's been so phenomenal talking to you today, man, and really appreciate all the uh, the screen flows that you've shared with us today. So when I've had a look at Repo, I've had a look at WaveLab as well. Um, oh, one question I forgot to ask you, actually. What speakers are you using, man? What what speakers do you use in your studio at the minute? Um, they're PSI Audio. They're A215M, so they're they call them like Mike, uh, I forgot the right word. They're not huge towers. I mean, I'm taller yeah. than the speakers, but they're tower, tower like. Um, it's a three way speaker. Um, and PSI is made in Switzerland. They kind of pride themselves on being all analog. There's no DSP. Um, they just build it right so that it sounds great. Again, all natural with no uh, processing. Yeah. Um, probably when I moved to my last space, so when I first got them, I was working on my old house in the basement. This is many years ago. Yeah. And I didn't feel the need for subs. When I moved to my studio that I had for the last four years or so until recently, it was a bigger room and I felt the need for subwoofers because um, since the room was bigger, I was pushing them a little harder and I just found I was um, with bass heavy music, I was kind of hitting the max and and engaging the limiter on the speaker so i added the subs yeah in part in part for more headroom and part for more just bottom end so i added two st uh two subs because i think in mastering it's good to have stereo subs yeah so they're the psi a125 subs for each side but yeah basically psi makes a wide range of speakers uh, in switzerland and, and like most things in switzerland they're not cheap but no nope. but they are very high quality you know swiss swiss precision um, really great small company if you want to email them and ask questions they're really helpful yeah and I, i've actually seen psi take off quite a bit you know when i when i started using them i didn't know anyone else using them and now you see them i think sweetwater started to carry them and i don't know if you know sweetwater yeah. in the u.s one of the bigger ones so mm -hmm. they're starting to get out there now if you look up psi um, great speakers um, yeah i have no plans to change them out because they just they work for me Brilliant. So cool. Thanks so much for that, man. Uh, Justin, it's been phenomenal chatting to you today, man. Um, just like before you go then, so uh, what's next for you? What's next on your journey then? Uh, obviously, you've been doing what you do for many years now. So uh, what's next uh, in your epic journey? Um, I think just hopefully continue to be lucky enough to keep doing it. You know, I, every year has since I started the mastering business officially in 2009, you know, that's when I registered it with the government and got on the books officially. Obviously, I was working way before that, but um, yeah. So it's going over ten years now. I mean, if I can just be lucky enough to keep doing it till I feel like I want to slow down or retire, that's really all that's on my goal. I mean, I've been. My point was, you know, every year's been better than the last, so I feel like I'm still on an upward trajectory as far as yeah. doing better, 
personally doing better mastering, um, getting better and bigger clients and albums and cl jobs and things like that. And with some of the efficiency stuff we talked about, just being able to do more. I mean, um, once you kind of get in a, a, a groove, you know, I, I'm able, I've mastered way more songs this year already. You know, I guess, you know, we're almost to the end of the year, but, you know, I probably mastered almost twice as many projects as I would have done in like 2015 or something like that, because wow. I'm just able to work more efficiently and I have more, you know, experience where that I'd know what not to do. And so, yeah, just keep, keep on going on and hopefully, you know, at some point get to a point where I can slow down and still do what I do at a slower pace and enjoy some other things in life, you know, outdoors and things like that. But no, Absolutely no, brilliant. no major plans to change course. You know, I do have a little bit of a interest in dialogue editing. Uh, we didn't talk about that too much, but yeah, for the last 10 years, there's, there is one company in Milwaukee that hires me to, um, and it's, it's totally random. Sometimes they slam me with stuff and sometimes I don't hear from them for a few months, but I, I do a little bit of post-production work for them too, where it's just, they, they shoot and edit videos that are like three to five minutes long. And then I go crazy with RX to clean it up, clean up all the noise, you know, cause they film them in it's on location. It's like documentary type storytelling. And, uh, Brilliant. so I, I kind of have a, a little bit of a, a passion for that too because it gives my ears a rest from like you know pounding yeah, music yeah, yeah. but it's still audio and rx focused and it's still it's still in my wheelhouse it's just it's just not music but i do like to do and i did mix one full-length documentary and i don't think i want to do that again because that was really intense there's this band called jawbreaker who were kind of big in the 90s uh, with oh yeah no stuff. jawbreaker yeah yeah, yeah so I, I mixed that documentary which was kind of a mess because it went through a few different hands of production yeah. stages. And by the time I got it, it was the audio was a little bit of a mess, but what I really like to edit are these shorter storytelling videos. You see a lot of them on companies' websites, you know, three to five, six minutes of telling the story of what this company does. I love kind of doing the audio on those, the audio sweetening, if you will, because yeah. there's so many like little things to clean up with RX that, it's just outside of video editors skill set and scope or even radar and then by the time you even do like a quick you know a couple hours on it they're like it's a it's all of a sudden a million times better because it's not just the raw audio from the camera you know and it's not a it's not a preset in final cut it's like someone actually thoughtfully did that so i could see doing a little bit more of that you know especially as video content takes over the world as it already has yeah between that and you know every netflix amazon apple all have their own original broadcasting now you know the original shows so i could see transitioning into dialogue editing and stuff like that at some point if my ears need a rest but overall no plans to change i like working on music of all genres all styles absolutely brilliant thanks so much justin uh thanks for your time today man uh, just to everyone that's watching as well and uh, obviously uh if you've missed um some of the the chat that we've had today with justin uh feel free to join our community we're almost up to three thousand members which is facebook.com forward slash produce i'm sorry forward slash groups forward slash produce mix fix and conquer uh, and our youtube channel which is youtube.com forward slash produce mix fix and conquer so in retrospect, we're a tiny community, but we have some of the best engineers in the world like Justin uh, that grace our pages as well. So we're so thankful, Justin, for your time today, man. It's been absolutely brilliant. And uh, we've got so many other great engineers on there like Bob Katz as well as Justin's mentioned as well. So feel free to get stuck in. Uh, feel free to catch up on the videos. There's over 50 hours worth of content, including Justin's video as well, which will be on our YouTube channel. And as Justin said as well, check out the, uh, the Wave Lab uh, website as well. So what was that Wave Lab website again, Justin, to check out, man? Uh, it's it's wavelabhelp.com. And then there's a Facebook group if you just search on Facebook or Meta, as it's going to be known from here on out. If you look on Meta, it's called um, Wave Lab. Uh, yeah, it's called Wave Lab Users Group on, on, on Meta slash Facebook. So you should be able to find us there. And I try to keep it specifically to Wave Lab content. I try not to get into the weeds of LUFS, like we talked about, because there's so many groups for all that. I just 
really yeah. focus on people that want to learn wave lab specifically and that's what it's for absolutely brilliant thanks so much man but yeah justin feel free to hang out once we end the live as well but thanks everyone for sending through the questions um absolutely feel free to send uh justin a couple of questions directly as well if you're happy for that justin if people have got questions about mastering in general as well if that's cool with you yeah definitely and thanks for having me on i know it's getting late over by you but i appreciate you having me on it was fun to chat about all this stuff oh it's been awesome man thanks a lot. thanks everyone for joining as well and uh take care and we've uh, we've got another guest coming up next week thanks a lot guys